All right. Well, we definitely have reached critical mass. So I think we can stop sharing the, the poll questions and get on with our program. Um, to start things off, so I'm Ben Bacenta. I'm the Director of Regional Planning at the Puget Sound Regional Council, um, which is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Central Puget Sound Region, which covers Kings, Nahomish, Pierce, and Kipsap counties. Um, and this program this morning, um, focused on TOD, is hosted by our Regional Transit Ori Oriented Development Committee, which is a standing committee that meets quarterly at PSRC, made up of professionals and um, local government employees and transit agencies employees um, and some elected officials to work on the challenging issues surrounding TOD and to uh, work on what we think solutions might be, to explore issues and to um, share information like the program that we're doing this morning. And so um, we're really happy. This is, I think, the fourth of these events, fourth or fifth of these events that we've done. Um, we're going to be doing them annually. And so um, we're happy you all could join us here um, today. Uh, looks like we've got some um, information for you, Sybil, in the chat. If you can send that over to Laura Benjamin, um, we can make sure that you um, get registration information for the Everett um, walk this afternoon. So I'd like to begin um, before our program really starts with um, an acknowledgement, uh, a land acknowledgement. Uh, Puget Sound is part of a larger area that is the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples who have lived here since time immemorial and ceded land under duress. While each tribe is unique, all share in having a deep connection with and legacy of respect for the land and natural resources of this region. These sovereign tribal nations continue to enrich the region through environmental stewardship, cultural heritage, economic development, and collaboration on local and regional initiatives. PSRC welcomes tribes to join as members and serve on its boards. PSRC um, seeks involvement from all tribes in the region in the development of policies, plans, and funding decisions. With gratitude, we honor the land, the water, and the peoples and work to uphold um, treaty rights and enhance co collaboration. Before um, I introduce PSRC President uh, Claudia Palducci to kick things off, a little housekeeping. If you have quest a question for the panelists, please, please from now on um, use the Q&A feature. We're gonna be closing down the chat. If you have registered for an afternoon walking tour and have questions, um, please contact Laura Benjamin. Her contact information will be shared in, in a moment. Um, and with that, I will um, introduce our um, pres PSRC's president. So King County Council Member Claudia Balducci is a mom, transportation and affordable housing leader, and a former public safety official. She believes that government should tackle the big issues that matter to people, notably housing, transportation, and the environment. Claudia represents King County District 6 on the east side. Um, for those of you outside of our region, those are uh, that's east of the city of Seattle, across Lake Washington. And in 2022, was reelected by her colleagues to chair the King County Council for a third year. Uh, Claudia first became active in civic life when she joined her neighbors to advocate for the revitalization of her local shopping center in the Lake Hills community of Bellevue. She went on to serve as the Bell serve on the Bellevue City Council, including one term as mayor. She's a regional leader, serving as chair of the Sound Transit Bo uh, Board System Expansion Committee president of the Puget Sound Regional Council and chair of the county's affordable housing committee. So with that, we welcome uh, council member Balducci and um, we'll really welcome her opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, can you hear me okay? Very good, thanks. Well, welcome everyone. I'm just so thrilled to be able to welcome you all to join us uh, this morning at this incredible event. Uh, as Ben said, a lot of my work and my priorities as an elected official have focused on transportation, housing, and the environment. And because of that, I am very committed to advancing transit-oriented development because this is just one of the keys to unlocking a, a, a wonderful future in all of those areas. I'm just so very excited that PSRC is hosting this event today so that we can explore innovative techniques and best practices mm -hmm. in building thriving and equitable transit-oriented development. Looks like you have a very fun and exciting day ahead with great speakers and panels, and I see walking tours. I just wanna welcome you all. Uh, I'm gonna start the morning off with just a little bit of history to demonstrate some of the path that we have come on in our region on transit-oriented development. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar, we, uh, 
at PSRC pioneered uh, the growing transit community strategy. This was an effort the region began nearly a decade ago to get ahead of what we knew was coming, historic investments in high capacity transit as we built out our light rail system, our regional bus network, among other things. Growing Transit Communities was supported by a Federal Sustainable Communities Initiative grant, which was presented uh, as a little bit of trivia in person in the PSRC boardroom by then HUD Undersecretary Ron Sims, who was a former King County executive and my boss and a lovely guy. And this initiative brought together a broad partnership of public, private, and non-governmental stakeholders to imagine the future of the region's transit corridors and to come to common agreement about their role in the region. So some key goals emerged uh, in this process. We wanted to attract growth to these areas, preserve and create housing affordability, as I think many of you experience in your areas and, and everybody who's here in the Puget Sound area knows we have a very big challenge with housing affordability. And we also, as a key goal, wanted to ensure access to opportunity for all of the region's residents. Since the growing transit community strategy was adopted in 2014, the voters and the decision makers of the Central Puget Sound region committed to make extraordinary levels of investment in high capacity transit, notably by adopting our Sound Transit Phase 3 program, which is one of the, if not the largest transit expansion in the country. Our commitment is reflected in our regional planning work. Puget Sound Regional Council and its members spent two years updating our region's long range growth management plan, Vision 2050, and we adopted it in 2020. In Vision 2050, growth near high capacity transit is identified as a critically important strategy as we expect another 1.8 million people and 1.2 million jobs in our region by 2050. This represents a renewed focus on growth near current and future high capacity transit and will be an essential part of reading, reaching our climate, mobility, housing, and growth goals. Rail, ferry, and bus rapid transit station areas are ideal for increased density. New residences and businesses referred to, as you all know, uh, as Transit Oriented Development or TOD. The combined effort of local governments and agencies are gonna be needed to achieve this vision and the desired outcomes for transit-oriented development. A wide range of communities in the central Puget Sound region now have fast, frequent, and reliable transit, and many more will have it in the future. And I wanna make sure we're clear that while transit-oriented development efforts are often focused around light rail, they can also be focused around bus rapid transit and all communities can benefit from planning to support transit. We here are planning for over a million new residents to live near transit. And we've seen some major successes already that prove the benefit of good TOD planning. I wanna point out just for a second that at our other regional body, the Sound Transit uh, Agency, which is delivering our major transit program, we have a TOD program that has 2,500 homes built or in process leveraging $1.4 billion in total public and private investment in projects built or in process. And many of these, almost two thirds of these units will be affordable right near our high capacity transit stations. In my own city, which you can see here behind me, uh, city of Bellevue, we uh, upzoned and planned for significant new development, including affordable housing right around our future light rail stations in the Bell Red area and are already seeing tremendous growth and potential in that area. We've attracted major new employers like Facebook, as well as housing, open space, and places to gather. And partnering with our transit uh, agency, one of the next developments in this area will include 500 units of housing, 280 of which will be subsidized affordable housing. So this strategy of developing TOD really works. But it's important to stress what we've seen nationally and in our own region that growth doesn't always benefit everyone. Uh, we need to reduce and prevent displacement. This is a very real problem as we build out transit. We need to expand affordability for transit investments to really live up to their promise. So we have a lot of work ahead to make sure that our commitments to transit become a reality and to make sure that the communities that surround our transit systems are inclusive, inviting and thriving neighborhoods. I look uh, forward to the day ahead and the conversations you all will have. I know many of you will be an important part 
of our work here in the Puget Sound region to achieve the ambitious vision that we're laying for our future. I hope that all of us learn from each other ways to achieve the promise of transit-oriented development in all of our communities. And again, I welcome you today. Thanks so much for being here. And now I'll hand it back to Ben to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, President Belducci, for that wonderful context for um, the program today and for the ongoing work in the region. Um, really appreciate um, your time and your ability to be here this morning. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to our this morning's keynote speaker. We're, we're thrilled to be joined this morning by Dean Kralios, uh, Managing Principal of SMR Architects, which is one of the region's most honored architecture firms that is firmly rooted in our community with a commitment to preserving history, creating sustainable spaces, and designing for people. Uh, Dean graduated from Wesleyan University in 1992 with a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology and Archaeology and from the University of Washington's College of Built Environments in 1998 with a Master of Architecture and a Certificate in Historic Preservation and Design. Uh, Dean joined SMR Architects in 2000 and has been a principal and equity partner in the firm since 2009. His projects include permanent supportive housing, affordable family and senior, senior housing, mixed use transit oriented development, and the rehabilitation and adaptive reuse of existing structures. A focus on sustainability has been a common thread among these diverse project types. Through his background in anthropology and preservation, Dean has come to appreciate the active role buildings play in forming meaningful community and endeavors to create thoughtful spaces that contribute to a sense of place. Dean will, this morning, um, again, so happy that Dean is here to share his experience in how architecture and design must respond to community and its needs through highlighting some award-winning TOD projects uh, designed by SMR. Dean, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Ben. Can everyone hear and see me okay? Yep. Great. Um, I'm going to share my screen, so bear with me while I get things set up. All right, can folks see my screen? We're good to go. Take All it right. away, Dean. Well, thanks again, Ben, um, and good morning, everyone. It's really great to finally get some relief from the poor air quality today. Um, as Ben mentioned, my name is Dean Kralios, and I'm a managing principal at SMR Architects in Seattle, Washington. And SMR is a mid-sized full-service architectural practice that focuses on the design of new and preservation of existing multifamily affordable housing throughout Washington State. And affordable housing is a pretty broad umbrella term that covers projects from shelter to workforce housing and everything in between. And while SMR does design work within all those project types, the project types I personally get most excited about are community oriented developments with multiple uses and program components that serve the needs of the neighborhoods in which they are located. And sites near transit centers are inherently well suited for supporting just those types of developments. This morning, I'll be touching on two transit-oriented developments SMR has completed in Seattle, Plaza Roberto Maestas and 12th Avenue Arts. Both are projects that I feel successfully embrace the concept of TOD for all. <clears throat> Plaza Roberto Maestas is a landmark, equitable, transit-oriented development in Seattle's North Beacon Hill neighborhood. Developed by El Centro de la Raza, the project took community established goals and priorities and incorporated them into a new mixed use development that serves multiple uses in a rapidly gentrifying neighborhood. Named after El Centro de la Raza's late founder and former executive director, Plaza Roberto Maesta started construction in 2013 of April and was completed in September, 2016. The project sits on what was once a former surface parking lot located immediately south of the historic 1904 Beacon Hill School Building, which has served as El Centro's main headquarters since 1972. It is also directly across the street from the Beacon Hill Light Rail Station, which opened in July of 2019, uh, 2009. The development consists of two six-story buildings, 
uh, that flank a public outdoor plaza and face onto Roberto Maestas Festival Street. Key program components include a seven classroom child development center, small ground floor commercial space, a multi-use cultural center, opportunities for micro business, office space, and 112 units of affordable housing. Early planning efforts for the development started almost eight years prior to construction. Development of Sound Transit's Beacon Hill Station prompted the North Beacon Hill community to work on implementing updates to the existing 1999 neighborhood plan. The effort focused on zoning changes that would increase density and encourage additional mixed use commercial and residential development around the new light rail station. Between 2008 in 2010, through a community-driven process in which El Centro played a key role, the neighborhood developed 10 neighborhood plan goals, which included prioritizing development of affordable family-sized apartments near the light rail station, developing a civil ga gathering space at El Centro, and creating opportunities for small and local uh, businesses. Consistent with the neighborhood's goals, these planning efforts ultimately resulted in an upzone of several properties in the North Beacon Hill residential urban village. And this slide here shows the existing zoning in the neighborhood prior to 2012, which had the maximum height limit for most parcels at 40 feet. And this next image shows zoning changes supported in the updated neighborhood plan with several parcels uh, near the light rail station increased to 65 foot maximum height. The city officially adopted zoning changes in 2012, which increased the northern portion of the El Centro property where the schoolhouse building is located from a single family to low rise three and from single family to neighborhood commercial two in the southern portion of the property with the maximum height limit of 65 feet. <clears throat> so that really paved the way for uh, the development to, to start taking place. When El Centro started early project planning, it took to heart the community's priorities. The project's team vision was to create a culturally sensitive and appropriate development that would serve as the anchor project in and a catalyst for the redevelopment of North Beacon Hill. As a community-oriented project, Plaza Roberto Maestas responds to multiple goals outlined in the updated neighborhood plan, including contributing to a well-defined mixed use residential neighborhood, creating a civic gathering space appropriate and flexible for the diversity of cultures living in the neighborhood, providing higher density development near transit, and adding to a mix of available housing options. Project planning included a robust community engagement and outreach process to ensure that community needs were incorporated while also working to ensure that families, seniors, and people of color would have the opportunity to remain in their community. The project held several meetings with different stakeholder groups throughout the design process, including the Beacon Hill Merchants Association, which provided feedback on the size of commercial spaces, degree of tenant improvement build out, and the types of tenants most likely uh, to occupy the space. The team also organized specific community design charrettes each one focusing on a separate program element, such as the Child Development Center, the Cultural Center, and even discussing the parking needs for the project. Because El Centro engaged early on in conversations with the community, when it finally got to the actual design and development phase, the project enjoyed near universal neighborhood support. As mentioned, the project um, incorporates many program elements that fill multiple community priorities. The Jose Marti Child Development Center, a dual language early learning center for kids age one through five, emphasizes cultural diversity, social justice, and family involvement to foster self-awareness, cultural pride, and self-esteem. The center is located in the West Building, um, immediately across the street from Santos Rodriguez Park and adjacent to the plaza. It includes seven classrooms, each serving 20 to 26 students. 
approximately 3,400 square feet of flexible ground floor commercial space was also included in the West building as well to help anchor the burgeoning business district developing near the light rail station. These spaces currently are home to the Station Coffee House, Seattle Credit Union, and Tacos Chukis, all small local businesses. The ground floor of the East Building, marking the entrance into the plaza, is a 5,700 square foot cultural center that provides affordable, rentable uh, event space for up to 250 people and includes state-of-the-art audio-visual systems and a commissary commercial kitchen, which can be rented. Garage doors open out onto the exterior, um, the plaza and the festival street to allow for spaces to flow out um, during nice weather. The cultural center lobby features an interpretive wall detailing the history of El Centro Schoolhouse and the sponsor's long uh, fight for social justice. One of the more unique elements of the development is its food cart program. El Centro purchased eight food carts to provide emerging micro businesses with tools, knowledge, and space to start or grow their business. Vendors who are chosen through an application process get a cart, a table, and a canopy for a year's lease. They also have access to a development com to the development's commissary kitchen. And the following slides show photos of some of the ground floor uses I just talked about. So you can see the Child Development Center, some of the ground floor commercial, the cultural center with the garage door open, commissary kitchen, and then some of the food carts in action. The project also includes roughly 4,700 square feet of office space on the second floor of the East Building. The space includes its own separate entrance and elevator access from the plaza level and currently is home to Beacon Development Group, an affordable housing consulting firm working with nonprofits and housing authorities and also served as the development consultant for this project. Plaza Roberto Maisas provides 112 affordable housing units that serve individuals earning between 30 and 60% of area median income. The unit mix consists of 35 one bedroom, 55 two bedroom, and 22 three bedroom apartments, as well as shared laundry rooms, community rooms, and outdoor gathering spaces. The larger size apartments create housing opportunities for families to live within the city. Two of the two bedroom apartments are live work units that are located at the plaza level and also create micro business opportunities for those residents. And this slide here shows a typical floor plan of the west and east building and the large outdoor family courtyard for the west building. And then just some of the images. Um, this is the rooftop deck of the East Building and the courtyard space of the West Building. Beacon Hills office space. And then just the sixth floor, the top floor of each building, and you can see the roof deck here. And of course, the centerpiece of the development is the eponymous plaza, which provides 11,000 square feet of flexible community gathering space and is a venue for several events held throughout the year, including Cinco de Mayo and Dio de los Muertos celebrations. One of the most unique aspects of Plaza Roberto Maestas is the custom artwork that celebrates Latino, Native American, African American, and Asian American culture that has been integrated throughout the project, including at exterior concrete pilasters, the building entrances to the cultural and child development centers, building eaves, and interior flooring. And here you can see examples of the art, at the, some of the pilasters, as well as the large tile mural of Jose Marti at the entrance of the Child Development Center, and then photos of activity in the plaza. Six years after its completion, Plaza Roberto Maestas continues to serve as a model for equitable, community inspired transit oriented development and has become a multicultural hub for the neighborhood. The project received a Puget Sound Regional Council Vision 2040 Award in 2017 and was a recipient of ULI's Jack Camp Award for Excellence in Affordable and Workforce Housing in 2019. Next project I'm going to talk about is 12th Avenue Arts. 
12th Avenue Arts is a vibrant, multi-use building developed by Community Roots Housing and located at the intersection of Seattle's Capitol Hill and Pike Pine neighborhoods. As with Plaza Roberto Maestas, this project sought to address multiple community goals and priorities within a single mixed-use development that provides a center for arts, local nonprofits, affordable housing, and public safety needs. The project broke the ground in February of 2013 and was completed in September 2014. At just over 29,000 square feet in area, the site was once home to a surface parking lot for 77 vehicles and a fueling station that served the Seattle De Police Department's East Precinct. The activation of this specific property had been identified in two separate neighborhood plans as a high community priority given the site's development potential and its location within the most densely populated neighborhood in the Pacific Northwest. The site's location less than a half mile from, the, from several transit options, including the Capitol Hill light rail station, the first hill streetcar and several bus lines also made it ideal for redevelopment. The project incorporates two levels of secured underground parking for the Seattle Police Department, smaller ground floor commercial space, two black box theaters for performing arts, incubator office space for local nonprofits, and 88 units of affordable housing. Community Roots Housing first approached the city to discuss the potential redevelopment of the site for affordable housing in 1998. This led to the completion of the feasibility study and funding application to the city of uh, the city's office of housing in the fall of 1999. Um, the city concluded at that time the proposed development was financially infeasible due to SPD's fueling station requirements and the project was shelved. Between 2007 and 2009, community roots housing in the city took another pass at ironing out the logistics associated redeveloping the site but again, we're unable to arrive at a program that met, both, that met both budget constraints and SPD's facility requirements. During that same time frame, Capitol Hill was witnessing rapid redevelopment. Many of the area's older apartment homes and, and single family homes were being demolished to make way for newer market rate multifamily developments. This reduced housing options available for many long-term lower income residents living in the neighborhood. These same market forces also led to rising rents, which resulted in the loss of several affordable performance venues that local arts organizations called home. Finally, in 2011, after more than 12 years of redevelopment discussions, the city moved to classify the site as an excess property with the understanding that community roots housing would construct a below grade parking garage structure for 115 vehicles for SPD's exclusive use in exchange for a transfer of the property. Additionally, the city eliminated the requirement to maintain a fueling station on the site. And together, these decisions created the pathway for stakeholders to move forward with the development. As the Public Development Authority serving Capitol Hill, Community Roots Housing understood the community's longtime need for affordable housing and performing art space. It also had the vision to bring those uses along with smaller retail spaces, office space, and community meeting rooms under a single roof on a large underutilized property in the heart of the community. Community Roots Housing met with numerous organizations, community members, and project partners to realize the vision for 12th Avenue Arts. It also convened an arts advisory committee with members from local arts organizations to determine what type of performance space would best serve the local arts community. Topics discussed included size and configuration of the venue, amenities to support the use, and who the likely users would be. The community building conducted around the development, specifically working with local businesses and artistic leaders, enabled the building to be inclusive and representative of the culture of Capitol Hill. And the evidence of this was seen for the overwhelming positive feedback and support from the neighborhood. And here's a picture showing the groundbreaking. As noted, the project was largely made possible by the city's contribution 
of the property in exchange for development of a secure underground parking garage for the Seattle Police Department. The garage accommodates 115 vehicles and other support spaces. The roughly 34,500 square foot parking structure had to be constructed to essential facility standards to be capable of providing essential services to the public after a disaster. And for security reasons, the garage is completely isolated from other building uses. So here's the first level. Other ground floor commercial art uses included three ground floor commercial retail spaces ranging in size from 950 to 1,960 square feet that front onto 12th Avenue and help activate the streetscape. To maximize the flexibility of these spaces, Community Roots Housing provided infrastructure for three type one exhaust hoods, an attractive and necessary amenity for restaurant tenants. Not surprisingly, the spaces currently are home to three small local restaurants, Rachel's Ginger Beer, How Many Dumplings Are, and Udon Noodles. At the center of the development are two affordable performing arts venues, a 149 seat main stage theater and an 80 seat studio theater. Both were designed as black box theaters, which allow for a variety of stage and seating configurations. Each space is supported with dressing rooms, a green room, a modern sound system, a scenery shop, control rooms, and both share the building's main lobby. Theaters were constructed to isolate airborne sound and vibration in order to mitigate noise transfer between adjacent uses. A consortium of three theater companies, Strawberry Theater Workshop, Washington Ensemble Theater, and New Century Theater Company are the anchor tenants. Their subsidiary, Block, Black Box Operations, manages the venues and rents them out to other arts organizations. The following are images of the ground level uses we just talked about. So you can see here the main building entry flanked by Rachel's Ginger Beer and how many uh, dumplings are, and then the entrance to the Seattle Police Department's parking space. And then the building lobby and two of the theater spaces. Second floor of the building provides roughly 13,000 square feet of incubator office and support space for nonprofit business, as well as much needed community meeting space. There are examples of the two uh, large meeting rooms and office space on that level. The project also created 88 affordable apartments serving individuals and families earning 60% of area median income. The unit mix consists of eight studio units, 72 one bedroom units, including a manager's unit, and eight two bedroom, uh, two bedroom units, all located on the upper four stories of the building. Residential amenity areas include laundry room on each floor, community rooms, and several large exterior decks, including a deck with some pretty fantastic views of downtown, which you can see right here. And this, this slide is a building section through the building lobby that just kind of shows the layering of the different building uses and how those all kind of came together. The success of 12th Avenue Arts has served as a catalyst for the neighborhood, preserving economic diversity, creating new art and performance spaces, providing a cultural hub and retaining the vital artistic character of the neighborhood. It also serves as the de facto center for the Capitol Hill Arts District, the city's first designated arts and cultural district. 12th Avenue Arts received a Puget Sound Regional Council Vision 2040 Award in 2014 and was a 2015 winner in ULI's Global Award for Excellence program. Now, I understand not every TOD development will be, or even has to be, like Plaza Roberto Maestas or 12th Avenue Arts but there are a few lessons from these projects I feel can be applied as best practices in developing equitable transit communities. First is work to meaningfully engage with community stakeholders. They're really the experts on the neighborhoods and understand what types of uses the community needs, will support, and will patronize 
I mean, and that ultimately, I think, contributes to a project success. Consider partnering with other organizations to leverage financial and other resources, as well as tapping into unique expertise. Endeavor to create developments that incorporate multiple complementary uses that help support each other and serve the community. Try to build flexibility into commercial retail spaces to attract a variety of potential tenants. If possible, create common infrastructure such as shared restrooms that can reduce the cost for tenant improvements. And finally, be patient and persistent. Great projects can sometimes take a long time to gain momentum, but they're absolutely worth doing. Thank you all very much for your time this morning. Thank you, Dean. You know, and we have we do have a couple of minutes where we can um, pose a couple some questions that came through in the Q and A. I mean, these are amazing projects that really do highlight many of the the key issues, challenges, and opportunities um, that our panels in, in, the, later this morning will 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 address in in some more depth. Um, so, for the, for the first question um, that came through. And this is for Plaza Roberto Maestas. Um, can you explain a little bit about the festival street designation and what that entails? Yeah, I know enough, enough about that to be dangerous. Um, so it was <laughs> designated as a festival street before the development started. Um, and what that allows, um, it, it's a process that they had to apply to the city for. I think it's an SDOT um, designation, but it allows for the street to be closed th uh, at certain times. Um, and be open for events for the for the city uh, and for local arts organizations. So um, I think you just make plans. I think you have to submit an application to the city and say, we're gonna close it down for this weekend for an arts arts festival or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But um, the nice thing is there's a synergy between the, the plaza and, and the festival street. So you can have events in both spaces kind of spill over into each other. Right, yeah, those are, that's a great use of, of spaces like that. Uh, another attendee was curious, and this I suppose applies to, to both of these projects, whether affordable housing that allows for ownership was contemplated for either of the projects. Um, do you happen to know about that or is that something that the dev developers more took care of? You know, we, we have worked on some, um, some condo pro uh, affordable condo projects uh, that have ownership components, but neither of these projects have that as I just don't think it's in the model of either of the um, development organizations to do that. There right. are certain other ones. Um, I know HomeSite is one organization that does that. Um, yeah, there are other other providers that do. Right. Yeah, both of these organizations have an interest in managing affordable rental um, properties for the long term. That's right. right. Um, another question about the 12th um, Avenue Arts Project. Um, do you happen to know? Um, did it, well, there, there were no, I guess a clarification, were there any, there weren't any residential units on the site prior to this development? It was this, the parking lot, right? And right. Um, right. commercial building. So it's not as though it display, th this development displaced existing units, it just provided new units to the neighborhood. That That's correct. Yeah, it was, you know, it was a 29,000 square foot surface parking lot. And um, I think many people in the community just, <laughs> saw it as an affront to have that large a piece of property um, yeah. be so underutilized. Um, and if I recall, because it was the, the, the nature of the use, it was a fence around it with razor wire. And, you know, yeah, was, not, not was, very street friendly for not sure. Not the most welcoming um, street frontage on 12th Avenue. Uh, the last question that we have in here, um, um, and, and not being the operator of these buildings, I don't expect you would um, maybe have the answer, but if you do, have, do you know, if, have they tracked, have the either cap, Community Roots Housing or El Centro de la Raza um, tracked the origins of the tenants in these um, buildings? Um, are they from the neighborhood or um, did they you know, move to the neighborhood because of these opportunities? The, the residential tenants? Yeah. You know, um, I would say it's probably a mix. I know that El Centro de la Raza did a lot of early, um, I don't know if recruiting is the right term, but communicating to the neighborhood that, that, that this was a potential. And um, even though they, they can't legally give priority status to certain communities, I know that they, they did a lot of outreach to minority local um, individuals and families to let them know about this opportunity. Right. 
yeah, that's always a, a, a tricky a, a tricky thing to negotiate of, of how you attract, um, you know, tenants with real needs to these sorts of projects. Well, um, we've reached the end of our time with you, Dean. And so thank you so much for highlighting um, really terrific projects that um, really help set the stage of the critical issues uh, that we'll continue exploring. Uh, appreciate your time, uh, really impressed with the just the, the visionary aspects of these projects and, and appreciate how complex they are. So thank you. Um, and hopefully you can um, stick around and enjoy some of the panels uh, later this morning. My pleasure. Thanks, Ben. Great. So we'll, we'll move into our, our next panel. Um, and uh, to, to let people know about what's coming up, uh, we'll have two panels this morning. There'll be a break, in be a 15 minute break in between them. So um, give everyone an opportunity to stretch their legs. Um, so the first panel uh, where it is focused on, um, we call industry perspectives or professionals who are working in development and design. Um, and we're really happy this morning to have an old friend of PSRC, um, a representative from uh, the Urban Land Institute Northwest District, District Council, um, Andrea Newton, the executive director, uh, will be facilitating a panel of industry experts um, for our first panel. Um, Andrea brings more than 25 years of experience in real estate. She began her career at a pension fund advisory firm, um, now Bentall Green Oak, uh, and then moved to resource real estate to direct the Western region of the US. Through various roles and consulting work, she gained extensive experience in asset management, portfolio management, and developing and stewarding a network of relationships with investors, stakeholders, and corporate partners. Uh, during the 2008 real estate downturn, she also served as executive director for Imagining the World, an international health core, healthcare technology nonprofit. Um, so with that, um, welcome, Andrea, who will introduce the rest of our panel. Thank you, Ben. It's always good to see you. Appreciate it. And I'm, I'm excited to be here. Um, I'll just very quickly introduce the rest of the panel and then um, allow them to speak for themselves. Um, first of all, we have Angela Rosman, who's the Director of Sustainable Development at Natural and Built Environments, LLC. And as a member of senior management, she facilitates the overall development with a focus on transportation and sustainability. Um, then we have Scott Surdike, and he's a Senior Development Manager at Lake Union Partners with a primary focus on mixed use, mixed income, and transit-oriented projects. Scott's expertise ranges from mid-rise apartments in emerging neighborhoods to high-rise condominiums in downtown Seattle. And then we have Fred Young, and he's an active transportation planner with Parametrics. He has over 20 years experience working on public projects that enhance the livability of communities. His work focuses on improving access to transit for people walking and riding bicycles, complete streets planning and design, bike share planning, wayfinding systems, and developing context appropriate design guidelines. So welcome. It's it's great to be here. <clears throat> I want to ask the panelists to like give a few words of introduction and tell us about what you're proud of and what you're passionate about and why you're sitting here today. Let's start with Angela. Hello. Uh, so I want to expand a little bit. So what we do is we're a small local business on the east side for those of us not from the Seattle area. I mean the east side of the lake. So Kirkland, Redmond, Bellevue, home of Microsoft and Costco, that area of the world. And what we build and uh, operate are all LEED Platinum certified market rate affordable housing. And so what I mean by market rate affordable is that uh, we do not get any government funding or tax credit subsidies, but the overwhelming majority of our residents make between 30 and 80 percent AMI. So um, we focus on very walkable 10 minute communities and um, a very large majority of our residents do not own vehicles. And that's very important to us as well. So glad to be here. Great. Thank you, Angela. How about you, Scott? Uh, thank you. My name is Scott Surdike. I'm a senior development manager with Lake Union Partners um, and specializing in mixed income and mixed use developments. I think um, our company has been really um, active and passionate about developing in under traditionally underserved communities. We've been uh, focused on the last 10 years at the intersection of 23rd and Union. 
And now we're focusing on projects uh, in the Rainier Valley. So um, really, I think passionate about placemaking, passionate about the concept of a mixed income development. And also really, um, our company really has a focus on local retail. And it's something we're really proud of. Our, our latest, uh, most recent project, Midtown Square, all of the retailers were um, BIPOC and, and primarily African-American owned businesses. And that's something that we spent several years really doing a lot of outreach and working with our investment partners to ensure that we provide flexible, affordable retail spaces, promoting small businesses. And we think that's really critical in, in terms of developing a healthy, um, well-rounded neighborhood. Great, thank you. How about you, Fred? Yeah, thanks for having me here today. So um, as Andrea mentioned, I have over 20 years experience working on uh, public projects. And for the last 10 years, I focused exclusively on active transportation. And specifically, um, that is everything from policy development to planning all the way through design of actual facilities. And currently in the region, uh, a lot of my work is focused on um, improving access to transit throughout the region, which is uh, really exciting, which is um, great to be part of this panel. Um, and just high, at a high level, um, I'm working with WashDOT on some design policy projects that um, are focused at reducing barriers to transit access within WashDOT right away. Well, I'll probably talk about that later. Um, tr working with transit agencies to plan and design all ages and abilities facilities to connect those stations to the surrounding neighborhoods. And I'm working with a few local cities um, to help plan for the coming light rail stations um, and thinking about how those, those networks will work and support that station. Um, and then also some complete streets corridor designs. Um, and finally, I bring my passion work every day. I've lived in multifamily housing for over 25 years. I live a car-free lifestyle, and for decades, I've relied on walking, riding my bike, and taking transit for basically all of my trips. Wow, that's inspiring. Well, I think with this mix of experience, we're going to have a really rich discussion today. Um, I'm going to set do a little context setting. Um, as probably most of you know, the central Puget Sound region stands to grow by more than 1.5 million people by 2050. And that's a lot of people in less than three decades from now. And our region also has been making historic investments in transit and over 1 million new residents are expected to live near high capacity transit by 2050. This means that an extraordinary amount of thoughtful community oriented development and supporting connectivity needs to occur relatively quickly. So I guess my question to all of you in a minute, you know, call call on you individually is how do you think the industry is shifting to respond to community needs and to advance more equitable development? And I'm, I'm gonna ask you to relay some examples from your recent work. And let's start with Angela, because I know Angela has been really focused on 10 minute communities. And, I, and if you wanna highlight a project or talk about, you know, some of the equi equity in your work, that would be wonderful. Sure, so our, um, I guess, I, I don't know if you call it flagship project perhaps is Arte and it is a 290 unit uh, mixed use, mi mixed income project in downtown Kirkland, two blocks from the transit center. But what we've learned is more important than the transit station is that we're right across from Kirkland Urban and the new Google campus and lots of services and shops and restaurants. And it's a place where, you know, I think a lot of us are seeing the issue of, you know, the grocery store is having trouble um, hiring and retaining employees because it's just too expensive to live here. The fast food restaurants, um, the pharmacy, pretty much all of our service industry especially is really, really struggling to keep employees and to hire out because it is so expensive. And so a lot of our residents live, you know, at Arte and then they walk to work or bike or bus. And 
you know, we've got managers of ice cream shops and bakers at the local grocery store and preschool teachers and folks that otherwise have told us that, you know, their previous residence was two hours away by car or three or four hours away by transit because they don't have a car. And something we really like to focus on is the fact that, you know, with most of our residents not making a high income, they are less likely to have a vehicle. But if you don't make a high income, a vehicle is a burden, not a privilege. And so we want to make it a privilege and an option for everyone to live near transit and services. And so that vehicle burden does not have to exist for them. Fred, <clears throat> on, that, on that note, um, I know you've recently lived and worked in Singapore, and I'm wondering if there are some examples of practices or development from that experience that could translate to our region. I mean, we're talking about a car-free lifestyle, so I'm curious what you might have to say. Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so late last year, I did return from uh, living and working in Southeast Asia for four years, um, and I have a lot to say. But I will keep it short. Um, so, uh, and all of my work focused on active mobility and getting people to and from stations in these cities across the region that are growing so fast. We think we're growing fast here, but Asia is on a different scale. Um, so when I first went over there, friends, family, colleagues said, Fred, you're crazy. No one is gonna ride a bike in the tropics. It's too hot. The monsoon is crazy. Um, and, it's not going to work. And so all those are all good points. And I took them uh, with me. But you know what, I'm an optimist and probably a little bit crazy. Um, and when I got there, uh, when I got to Singapore, I what I saw was nothing short of spectacular, I would go to MRT stations, uh, which is their their transit, their train line. Um, and there was parking space, there were bicycle parking spaces for three to 4,000 bicycles, and they were full overflow, overflowing. And at um, commute times, those would totally turn over. So they're being used. And there are people walking everywhere. And um, so some observations I made um, that if you build high quality infrastructure and make it easy for people to choose or walk um, to transit, they'll do it. It doesn't matter what the climate's like. And the mode share there is, um, the commute mode share for transit is 44%, driving is 20%. So they've really shifted the needle over and they're still working on it. Um, and the, the thing that really was cool to learn about Singapore when I was working with them is that they start with the global best practices and then they apply it and then they adapt it and, and find out ways it's working and not working, they adapt it to the local context, which is absolutely spectacular. But I think there are three things to highlight that they're doing really well that I think are, apply here. Um, first off, a density at uh, transit stations. So they build highly walkable districts around every single one of their transit stations. And these are destination rich multi-use uh, developments, just like um, what Dean was mentioning in his, his work, right? So they're small, lots of small, flexible spaces for businesses. Um, they're attractive outdoor spaces to be very convenient. So when you're getting off that train, you can stop at the market to grab whatever you need to for dinner. You can pick up your dry cleaning, pick up the kids from daycare. All of that stuff is super easy to do. So it's built, in, built into lifestyles. The second thing is, is really about lifestyle, which is car light lifestyle. So they're building these neighborhoods, not just the developments, but they're building an environment that is conducive to walking and riding bikes and not getting in your car. Um, and so all of your daily activities can really be completed within a very small distance from home. Um, and they're building high quality bike networks and um, encouraging shared modes. And that climate thing I mentioned earlier, they have built hundreds of miles of covered walkways that connect everything. So you're out there in the blazing heat, you're in shade, which is fantastic. That monsoon, you're dry. I would see people walking around without umbrellas and I could never understand how they were doing it until I realized that was the case. And then the final thing um, is something they're doing, which is um, definitely something that we need to do more of here 
and that is uh, preparing for a rapidly aging population. So they call it the silver tsunami. So they have this massive bubble of, of older people that, are the, that will soon be not working and uh, needing infrastructure that supports them. So um, they've de designated silver zones, um, and this is where they are prioritizing improvements um, to help navigation around those communities. Um, that could be anything from um, longer times to cross the street, shorter crossing distances for those streets, raised crossings, um, and just general um, traffic calming techniques to really slow down any vehicles that are out there so that um, it gives time and improves safety for our most vulnerable people. And that that's absolutely something that we could do more of here. That's an inspiring vision. <laughs> um, and let's bring it back home to Scott because he's, what's going to be really relevant is um, the, the Judkins Park Station tour today um, is right next to Grand Street Commons, which is a project that Scott's been very involved with. So I'm curious about, you know, what are the challenges that you're seeing in that regard in here, right here at home, when you're trying to put together a, an equitable transit oriented development? Well, I'll tell you, um, Fred kind of just, you know, hit the nail on the head, the importance of actually, okay, you're not supposed to, you know, we're not to just be building homes, like we're building apartments. This is to be a walkable neighborhood, to make it successful, to make it a place where people actually want to stay long-term, you have to have that infrastructure, pedestrian oriented infrastructure. And, you know, one of the challenge, I think a big challenge with Seattle is that our, our development pace has been so rapid that we haven't, you know, from a from a design or a city, a placemaking perspective, we haven't had a chance for one building to respond to the next, to respond to the next. So many have gone up at the same time. And I think likewise, the city, you know, the planners and transportation planners, SDOT, haven't kept up with what's going on. And I'll give you a real life example. We um, we have a newly formed, we have the North, uh, it's in early stages, the North Rainier Valley Partnership because there are a number of property owners, community members, developers building and investing, you know, thousands of units near the trans, uh, transit stations, specifically the, the Judkins Park Station and also the Mount Baker Station. But there has been little or no discussion about tr uh, street improvements, no, no side, no crosswalks. And, and Rainier has been, you know, very similar to Aurora it's, um, you know, it's been a pass through. It's been, you know, it was the heart of the community, but it's also just become major commercial corridor and, and really fast um, traffic. So we just went through an exercise. We understood there was an update to the comp plan happening. And there was also the SDOT was finalizing their updating their transportation plan. So we quickly formed and rushed and put in, hey, by the way, Hopefully you guys know there are more than 9,000 units planned or under construction in the Rainier Valley along the Rainier Corridor. And we've had no mention of, of street, uh, streetscape improvements, lighting, crosswalks. Crosswalks is super important because, you know, 40% uh, of the development is going to happen on the um, you know, near Judkins Park Station, it's happening on the west side of the street. And there's going to be a lot of, you know, there's a lot of affordable housing as well. So large family size uh, family size units and families crossing the street where there's no intersection. So we, we identified at least three places where we felt that pedestrian crosswalks were really important. Street lighting is important. Um, safety is important. Perception of safety. You know, there were um, Sound Transit is completing, you know, they have an entrance on Rainier under I-90, and there is an entrance um, to Judkins Park, and there's about five, you know, lamps or streetlights right at Judkins Park, and then you're kind of on your own in a park at night trying to get to, you know, the bulk of the development. So we, we've really been advocating for um, just those, those things that make the city walkable, safe, livable for pedestrians and for bikes, because in a similar manner, we, we don't, you know, we know that, that some of the residents are going to um, still have and need their car. I think our company, we figured it's about a, for market rate housing, it's about a 0.5 ratio. And we can, and for uh, more affordable housing, 
tends to be a little bit lower, but the closer you get to the station over time, people are gonna realize they don't have to have a car. So you naturally draw more people who, who don't want or don't need a car. But, <clears throat> but it is important to reinforce and enhance the pedestrian environment. And I think that's something that we haven't gotten ahead of, at least, at least you know, at the Judkins Park Station and, and certainly the Mount Baker Station where there's just signage and crossroads and it's just, you know, it's convoluted and it feels unsafe. So I think that's, that's something where we can take lessons from, you know, Portland, for example, or, or any other city, really investing in artwork, plants, streetlights, and also, you know, landscape we feel is really important. You know, uh, Rainier has some beautiful large trees, but we don't really have the median strips. We don't have that separation between the sidewalk, the hardscape, and Rainier. And so we're, we're really trying to implement more landscape, more a little bit of a, a sense of separation, a little sense of safety, sense of greenery, and make, make the corridor actually feel like, you know, it's a very uh, linear neighborhood. And so we're trying to create nodes and focus. And so there's points for the community to, to pause, to enjoy. And, um, and those are the elements that are gonna keep people living there, so. You know, you've highlighted something really important in what you've been talking about, and that's that no one project can be transit oriented development, right? It's about, it really should be a transit oriented district or a transit oriented community. And as part of that, you know, connectivity and micro mobility, micro transit, these are all critical parts of this. And, um, and, and as you mentioned, like walk up, how, how do you create pathways? And I'm just, I'm curious to hear, and maybe I'll start with Fred, because I think this is really your specialty, but like what, what could happen? What kind of changes do we need to facilitate good transit oriented districts, right? Because no one developer can do this. It, it's a, it's got to be coordinated. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it depends on the land use context, right? Huh? So if you're in, in Rainier Valley, it's going to be very different than if you're in um, Linwood or some of the outer Eastern uh, or Redmond, where Angela's working. Um, so I think really leveraging the the benefits that those those places have. So a lot of the um, more suburban, I'll call them, um, traditionally suburban places have, uh, especially Redmond, have fantastic trail networks already in place. Right, the the trail network is really great, and it's been developing over many years. Um, so that's that's good. Linwood. Um, and Shoreline are building trails that feed into their into their transit systems as well. So those are those start to form your spines in that type of landscape. Those are easy easier to to do um, in the near term. And then it's a matter of shifting the okay. We have that spine. We have the transit. We see people using it. And then it's a matter of shifting the priorities of how we use our street space, which is what um, cities like Bellevue and Seattle are definitely doing right now. Is having those tough discussions, what Bellevue has done over the last 10 years, they've had a major shift in how they are looking at their streets. Downtown, there are protected bike lanes. <laughs> 10 years ago, that was unheard of in downtown Bellevue. So, so doing that, having those tough conversations and realizing we don't have a lot of space in our cities, but they need to serve all these different modes um, and prioritize how we're moving people around rather than vehicles big vehicles. So really shifting that discussion is what needs to happen in, in urban areas. And then when you get to those transit nodes, thinking about um, what those transitions are like. So you're going from um, walking to some sort of shared mobility, whether it's a, a transit vehicle or a, a, a shared car or something. Um, and what do those mobility hubs look like? And that those are very land use cont contextual as well. And again, thinking at a holistic approach, um, the design of the place should be legible and easy to understand. Um, wayfinding can help navigate um, where you need to go. And those transfers should be as seamless as possible. They just should be absolutely, absolutely natural. And then the co-location co of different modes in those areas um, is absolutely essential as well um, so that you can make those transitions. And then it, it along with the co-location of modes, it's it's really going back to what Dean was saying, those all very finely tuned multi-use buildings with lots of small spaces so to make it 
really convenient for people to um, to go about their things. But so all of that needs to work with really rethinking about how our streets get prioritized for people. Angela, I feel like he's talked a lot about the east side. I feel like you, you might yeah. have something. I, I am going to push back on Redmond being a suburban community. Um, I know you talked about it being a, you know, traditionally suburban, and there's definitely been some friction there. But Redmond, Bellevue, Kirkland, their downtowns, um, Overlake, those are not suburban communities anymore. We are still seeing um, too high parking minimums as part of that legacy. But if you live in one of these downtown areas, you absolutely do not need a vehicle. Um, there is transit and trails and enough services nearby that you really don't need a vehicle. And that has been a very big shift over the last five to 10 years. Um, and unfortunately, part of that, you know, really vibrant um, development that's gone on is there has been very, very little affordable housing. So um, back to what I was saying, you know, it's really great that we have these like great walkable communities now, but a new two bedroom apartment in downtown Kirkland right now rents for about $4,500 a month, which is absolutely bananas when um, you think about where we were, you know, a decade ago. And it is so important that we make sure that these communities are equitable for folks, because otherwise, our teachers, our hairdressers, our um, construction workers, pretty much anyone who doesn't have that tech salary is getting pushed further and further out. And so it's really important for us to look at ways to make sure that these TOD communities are accessible to people who make less than you know 150% of the median income. Because even 100% AMI, any new apartments going in in these downtowns other than the 10% inclusionary zoning is absolutely out of reach. And so um, the Department of Commerce will say that we are about 800,000 units short of housing right now in the state of Washington. And um, by 2040, the uh, King County region is going to be about 300,000 affordable housing units short. And so it is really, really important when we talk about building out these 10-minute um, community areas is that we really focus on making sure that there is enough affordable housing for all. And I do want to just um, comment on one of the questions in the chat about RSA being a um, micro-housing community. We actually do have up to three bedroom units at RSA. Um, our two bedrooms go for about $2,500 compared to that $4,500. So we do have a wide range of units available. And as far as small units, shared kitchens, that sort of thing, we are so short when it comes to housing. We need all pieces. We need housing for single people. We need housing for families of six. We need housing for retirees that have downsized. We need so much housing in all different varieties. We don't have enough of any type. So I, I just want to say that we want to make sure that we are seeing that variety of housing. We absolutely need family housing. And um, the magic of doing some of the smaller individual units is that people who do not need two and three bedroom units have the ability to, to rent a smaller space alone versus perhaps um, sharing a two bedroom unit with a couple of people that don't really want to be roommates, but there's no other way to afford to live nearby, if you can afford to live on your own, then that two bedroom unit becomes available to families and that low income housing funding can go to that family housing. So it's, it's a really big hole that we're trying to dig out of and it's going to take so many shovels to even start to fill it in. I wanted to kind of, you know, talking on what you were saying about the affordable housing, the need for mixed income and more than, you know, lower AMI. I, I you know, we're really proud, this project that we're working on, Grand Street Commons, we think it's going to be a great case study because it's transit oriented, mixed income, brownfield development, but we also, we were able to take advantage of, um, the company was one of the first to take advantage of a new um, 
offering by a new grant from the Department of Ecology. And this is really significant. The Department of Ecology acknowledged that, you know, not only has Rainier had a history of redlining, but it's also been a source of, you know, environmental racism. And it's basically, they've allowed a lot of contamination to happen along the sites, which is why, you know, even 14 years after the first light rail stations went in, very little development, very little market rate development. You're now starting to see that change. The um, Department of Ecology has a grant that if you partner with, if a market rate developer partners with an affordable housing developer, and at least a 40 to 50% is their goal of those units are affordable housing, you will get a grant to pay for most or all of your environmental remediation. And it is significant because this, the project, Grand Street Commons, our partner is uh, Mount Baker Housing. The total project, it's three buildings, it's 770 units. And Mount Baker Housing's parcel is, uh, their building is 200 units of affordable housing. And then our, par our parcel, Lake Union Partners, is 570 units. And of that, we're doing, we're uh, participating in the MFTE program. So 20% of our units are affordable. And we build our MHA required units on site. So I think the site has a total, it's almost 350 units out of 770 will be affordable. And that's, um, you know, two blocks from the light rail station. I mean, significant. Uh, we, we also were able to achieve, I think, $4.7 million in grant money from the Department of Ecology to recoup the costs of environmental remediation. So really significant partnership on behalf of the DOE, City of Seattle, and also um, partnering with Mount Baker Housing and just super proud of it. I think we're, we're making and we're making a central plaza, um, you know, a central gathering space because it's also something that people want, families want and neighborhoods need. And since there's no further infrastructure planned by the city, we kind of took it on ourselves and we're building this, um, there's gonna be art and fountains and lots of retail, um, really trying to position this as a, as a town center, but um, you know that's it's a great model. We're actually this is our third project that we're taking advantage of this Department of Ecology grant, and it's really it's great results. We're also partnering with Community Roots Housing on another project. So there are ways that that encourage this because I, I agree. Otherwise, you know the land that's closest to the light rail station it's a hot commodity, especially the East Link because they know you're now collect connecting. Bellevue HQ2 Amazon with Microsoft, with Facebook, and that's high income. But we feel, you know, the Judkins Park Station, we know that there's a lot of retail, there's a lot of service industry, there's a lot of um, employment opportunity all throughout that East Link. And so we're gonna be providing, you know, just a great place for people to live and to be able to work in, in all these different, you know, the full spectrum, whether they're tech employees or restaurant workers or service hospitality industry. It's a, it's a great plan because nobody needs their car and you're making sure that you're providing housing to accommodate a, 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 a much wider range of things. I'm, I'm seeing the future. <laughs> Thanks for that vivid description. I'm, I'm gonna switch into a, an interesting question. I'm gonna try to get to some of the questions in the chat during this. Um, but I, I, while we're still on this topic a little bit, I wanna, um, somebody asked, um, about uh, specifically um, about Fred's work on planning for people of all ages and abilities. I think this is a really important question because, I mean, we've got this massive baby boomer population and, you know, silver tsunami coming our way. Um, so I'm curious about what, what could be different there, what, what's up and coming there, I guess. Yeah, I, I see that question too. Thanks for asking that. I think there are a number of things um, that can be done. One, I'm gonna talk, I wanna talk a little bit about my work with Wash Tax. I think that plays right into this. And then two, talk a little bit about what can be done. I think, um, is it Becky was asking about specifically at the block level, right? Mm -hmm. um, so currently I'm working with, with WashDOT on a project called Removing Highway Barriers to High Capacity Transit Station. Uh, access. And this is really around, and, and a couple of the, the workshops this afternoon will actually see some of the sites we're thinking about during this project, specifically the one to the south, the Des Moines Kent station, where you have on one side of the street, the new um, 
station going in, the new link station going in. The other side of Pacific Highway, um, six lanes of traffic, I think, right there. The other side of that is Highline College. And how do you get people? Those are those are affinity land uses, right? People want to go from one to the other. Um, so how do you get people across? And current WASHDOT design guidelines don't allow for a really great crossing there. So that is a barrier that that we're looking at. How does that manifest itself in existing um, wash dot processes? And um, so some of the things um, that they traditionally have looked at is is level of service for motor vehicles. That really defines a lot of what wash dot does, and that does not make a walkable environment, um, especially in a transit uh, friendly area, which is what we're all talking about. But things are things are changing. So this earlier this year, wash dot. Um, put into place a complete streets policy. So any wash dot project over $500,000 um, and meet certain thresholds must accommodate all um, active transportation modes. So it must have complete sidewalks. It must have bicycle facilities. Um, and this is really fantastic um, for our region. Because if you think about where these stations are going over the next decades, almost all of them are going on or adjacent to wash dot right away. So, so there's a barrier right there. We need to, we need to fix that. Uh, we need these, these districts to be walkable and friendly. So, and the policy or the, the barriers we're seeing as we're talking to people are, are those physical barriers I mentioned, also design barriers. So design guidelines, there just aren't really great design guidelines um, readily available at wash dot that are helping build high quality infrastructure. That's changing as well, but traditionally that, that isn't, isn't always there and there are opportunities for improvement. There are also procedural barriers and funding barriers that we're looking at. So all of that's changing. WashDOT is actually um, undergoing a lot of change right now, which is really fantastic. Um, so a lot of that can be tied back to what I was talking about in Singapore, where this, those streets aren't safe for anybody, let alone people with uh, mobility issues or if they're slower because of their age or, or whatever. Um, so that that is one thing that will help. Local jurisdictions have complete streets policies as well. And those are really focused on improving uh, walkable, bikeable environments. Um, and, and if your local jurisdiction doesn't have one, get one in place. <laughs> Talk to your elected officials, get one in place. Um, so that's kind of the, the lay of the land, I think, at the bigger scale. Getting down to the more development scale, there are a lot of things that can be done for end of trip facility or end of trip facility. So thinking about someone arriving as they're walking or riding a bike or by a wheelchair and making sure you have accessible routes that meet all of those ADA standards. Uh, that is absolutely critical. Um, um, that's, that's baseline at, at this point in time. Um, and then if you think about people arriving by bicycle, um, what do they need as they're transitioning from their trip to their destination? So if they live there, they need access to high quality, secure parking that's long-term, that has limited access that, that they can get into. Um, and if it's someone arriving at your development for work, they still need a longer term secure parking um, and they maybe need a place to change um, into whatever they need to do for work. Um, those types of things um, take space, but they're, they're absolutely necessary for that to help shift how people get around. Um, and then the other thing on a um, development is really thinking about wayfinding and, and designing from the beginning, working with your designers and planners to think about designing a space that is legible for people moving through that space and augmenting that with other wayfinding um, uh, devices. I think I could talk a lot about this, but I think I'll leave it right there. <laughs> I feel like we could talk about wayfinding for a really long time. <laughs> oh, dates, you want um, to? <laughs> but I'm, um, I want to switch gears a little bit because I think there's something else really important that we need to talk about. Um, you know, we've all been talking about T TOD projects and communities in pretty hot, dense markets and more established areas. Um, but in the next two years, Sound Transit will be opening 17 new light rail stations along 30 miles of new track, extending the system to the east side through Mercer Island, Bellevue, Redmond, 
um, and to the north through Shoreline and Mount, Mount, Mount Lake Terrace to Linwood and the south from SeaTac through Kent and Des Moines to Federal Way. So what are the differences you see between pursuing and executing projects in highly developed markets like Seattle and then these more suburban station areas and part part of what I'm I'm also thinking we could as part of this adjust um, address one of the questions in the chat about you know what do you do about that last mile access um, you know when people are not right on the light rail but they're living far out so um, let's see uh, let's start with Angela I'm I'm not because I know you're in an urban area you're not in a suburban area. <laughs> <laughs> but you might have some thoughts around this, I'm guessing. Yeah, well, I would say the biggest piece is making sure that we're not over parking these areas because mm -hmm. we have had a tradition of, mm -hmm. you know, more car ownership, harder to get around, but we need to be planning these communities for the next 20 to 50 years, not 10 years ago, which is what we're still seeing and making sure that we have the density around these light rail stations, you know, our region has spent billions of dollars on these new miles of transit and we still have areas where there are two, three, four story zones right next to transit. You know, we're seeing $2 million townhome communities going in within an easy walk of transit. That mm -hmm. is, you know, when it comes to the climate too, I, it, <laughs> we're finally getting the rain here after, you know, extraordinary, awful air quality and heat. And, you know, we need to start being serious about the climate. And if we're going to be serious about the climate as well as livability and commute, complete communities, is we need to make sure that we are building these areas right. And the thing is, is if, something is zoned for townhomes, once the townhomes are built, they're there for the next 50 years or more. And so we're, we're kind of at a race against time right now that once these projects are done, that's it. We're, you're not going to tear down $2 million brand new townhomes to put in a five to eight story mixed use community. So we need to make sure that we're getting it right the first time. Yeah, if we have a series of linked parking garages and <laughs> low density housing right next to the station areas, then we've failed, right? <laughs> and Angela, can I? I just appreciate you bringing that topic up because it's it's a hot button, and I, you know, this kind of goes back to Rainier, and I, um, you know, the importance of municipalities and or sound transit to educate people on the positive benefits of density. It's really important and it's an important story and it's a story that's happened everywhere over the world. But I don't think we told the story as well back in the day, you know, when the first leg of the light rail opened, there was a lot of contention and a lot of, um, you know, especially around MLK, oh, we're going to make it surface right through a traditional African-American and traditional red line and disadvantaged neighborhood. And that was, there was a real outroar from a lot of businesses, this uproar, um, you're gonna displace businesses, you're gonna displace homeowners. Um, we don't, you know, you're, you're running the light rail right along the road now instead of doing a tunnel. So, so the city really backed off on, you know, really held back in making uh, substantial zoning changes, specifically the Rainier Beach station. Shocking, you know, after 10 years after the light rail, was still up and running, you go down and you see the stop at the Rainier Beach light rail station. And there's a couple of townhomes from the 80s. And apparently the zoning went from, I don't know, 35 to 45 feet, NC 245, and no one would touch it. So I know it was a political hot button, but there is a solution. Really do the outreach, show the positives. Okay, there's 12 townhouses here, but I know there's a concern because this is a more affordable neighborhood, but we could have 200 units of affordable housing in the same place where we have 12 townhomes. So that conversation didn't happen. And so I, I really, that, that was really frustrating for me because there's so much economic advantage and opportunity when you increase the zoning. At the opposite end of the spectrum, I was thrilled that the city of Linwood went bold and said, okay, we, not be, we may not be ready for high rise, but if you want to build up to 300 feet, we're ready for you. So, you know, they looked to um, Burnaby and Surrey out of Vancouver for inspiration. At some point, high rises are going to make sense. 
So I think really um, it's kind of incumbent on the municipalities. If you're not there yet, I agree with you, Angela, forget the two and four story zoning, show a vision that is grander and long-term, but you can talk to the locals saying, you know, it's not gonna happen overnight. This is gonna be incremental. It's gonna be five story, four story, three story. At some point in the future, somebody's gonna to want to do that first story, 12 story building, let's encourage that. It just makes, it just makes sense. You know, you can see that starting to happen over our region, but holding back and hesitation. And frankly, you could tie it, you could also tie zoning and height increases as a bonus if you include affordable housing. Hey, you know, I know that uh, Bell Red, on the Bell Red quarter, the city of Bellevue, you get this FAR, two, whatever. <laughs> you get a two FAR. If you actually want your project to pencil and get to a four FAR, you have to pay or include affordable housing. You know, maybe working with developers, find out what's the magic number. If we ask you guys to include, if you include 50 uses of 50 units of affordable housing, you get to go up 45 feet higher if it makes sense or add density. So there's a, there's a wide range of tools, I think, to add incentive and bonus, even if the even if the municipality isn't there yet, you will eventually get there because each succeeding hub is going to get built out and you're the next in line. Okay, well, Northgate's going to get, get, get built first. We see it already happening at Alderwood, everything in between, Linwood, everything in between is going to fill up and eventually that's going to go up to Everett. So I think really um, being bold and, and, and having a vision, but articulating and selling that a vision, which I know can be challenging that that's that's really important well i mean on a, on a related note what are what are some examples of local governments that of what local governments could be doing that are true incentives to help you develop projects in proximity to high, high capacity transit and you know are they doing enough are they getting in the way what what should the local governments be doing to facilitate this at anyone <laughs> This is a tough one because every developer in the city would love for design review process to be more streamlined and in particular, <laughs> in particular, for affordable housing developers, it should be a streamlined process. If, if you, you know, if it takes two years now to get your MUP and your building permit, if, if, if an affordable housing development a developer or if teaming up with an affordable housing developer means you can get an expedited permit, we're going to commit to this in this is what California is doing. They just implemented, and I think it has to do, I heard about it somewhere in the Bay Area. It's like, if you have a project over X amount that has X amount of, um, I forget the percentage of affordable housing, you will have an expedited permit in, I don't know if it's six to 12 months. But if you can imagine, if you tied an expedited permit process to including an affordable housing component or te uh, teaming up, partnering with an affordable housing developer, the whole landscape would change overnight because everybody, rather than developing 400 units of market rate, now a developer is gonna say, think of how much time I'm gonna save, think of the money I'm gonna save, damn right I'm gonna partner with Mount Baker and we'll do 200 and 200 units. So I think it's just that that could be, I don't know as much about this new law in California, but I think it's um, relatively new in the neck in the last year, but that could be something to look into. I think certainly that would help incentivize for certainly mixed income and would help. Yeah, I'd say permitting and parking are probably the two biggest, quickest things that local jurisdictions can do to change um, the affordable housing conversation. How land is so expensive now, construction is so expensive now. Um, you know, we talk about developers having these big deep pockets that can just suck up all of this price increases. But the thing is, is that for most developers, they are not owning the property long term. It's um, large corporations from different parts of the world that have the equity to finance these projects to own them long term. And in order for them to buy them, they have to pencil out. And so for a developer to build something, the money has to make sense and if it doesn't then that money is going to go to different parts of the country where it does make sense and so you know in order to build the housing that we need and to get it to be affordable scott's point about um increasing permitting timelines is an absolutely huge one the cost of carrying a project can pay for affordable housing in a large part but we do need to make sure that 
the incentives are connected well enough with um, the expectations because we need to make sure the incentives are good enough so that it actually happens. Um, we don't want to over expect and then we get nothing. So that's kind of that um, fine line of making sure there's enough incentive without um, killing new development. Mm -hmm. And from the public infrastructure side of things, because that feeds into everything we're talking about and to Scott's point earlier about North Rainier Valley with all those units going in and the, um, the walkable environment not there, um, there's a lot of funding for public infrastructure, especially with the bills that have passed at the state level and the national level this, this last year. Um, uh, so that exists, but then also locally, um, Sound Transit has an access fund where they are looking at funding. They have millions of dollars to, to fund people, um, bicycle pedestrian improvements to get people to and from their stations. And that absolutely needs to go together um, with everything we're talking about to make these districts work well. Great. Well, I'm, we have so many questions in the chat. Um, ben, I'm, do you have, do you want to, I haven't read them all, but I feel like there's some really important questions in here. Let me review th through them. You've been answering yeah. many of them. I know. As, as just through your conversation. Um, but there was one that I saw that was um, pretty interesting. Um, oh, this, this one. So any of your thoughts? So, so Scott, you've mentioned the MHA program uh, that the city of Seattle has. And so folks from outside of the region, the region there's a mandatory housing affordability component to development where um, uh, development of, of a certain size have to provide affordable housing. Uh, but there is an option for offsite um, provision, either offsite or paying into the fund in, in the city. And so just curious about your, your perspectives of potential requirements to provide on-site affordability versus um, you know, paying into a fund that may not actually benefit uh, affordability in these fast growing areas in the city. I do know that most, <clears throat> I believe most developers pay into the fund. I think we're, there are fewer, um, and, and some of them see it as a you know, height bonus. Okay, we're gonna get to X point, we're gonna pay this amount. Um, I think our company has always just believed we can make it work. We also just feel like it's more inclusive. It's more equitable. I mean, just to have it on site makes sense. You know, I, I think, um, you know, the multifamily, the MFTE program is great. It is such an incentive for developers to have that 12 year tax abatement in exchange for 20% of your units to be affordable <clears throat> to 60 or 80% of AMI, um, but it, it really does work. And I think what's what's great about it also is you can't designate, okay, we're gonna provide affordable housing, affordable units on site, and they're gonna be the ones on the lower floors facing the alley. You know, part of the deal is that you are, there's an equitable distribution of these units. So it really brings everybody up. You know, you don't know if your neighbor is, is paying 20% less than you, or, or sorry, 40 or 50% less than you. So, um, you know, and even through design, like we've, we have the same architect doing our building as the um, Mount Baker housing project. So it's just the way to, to really make it, you know, truly equitable is, you know, not, not having distinctive, oh, that's the affordable housing project. So I think that kind of the integrated solution of, of providing the units on site, you know, cohesiveness in the design, um, we believe strongly it's it's much more of a benefit than, okay, here's your million dollars, build it somewhere else or not, because we're not going to have that in our project. And I think we've found that even if you have luxury or market rate, um, you just have a better lease up when you have, it looks like there's more traffic, more velocity, more buzz, but many of those units up front are the affordable units and they go first. But I, I think overall it, it helps everybody helps the lease up helps the community and it helps lifts everybody up socioeconomically excellent so angela so another question um, that came through from participants and it sort of it gets to that uh, well it gets to the benefit uh who is getting benefit from the development of these projects and it was a question about um 
you know, apprenticeship, apprenticeship options or kind of local hire in um, constructing buildings in these neighborhoods. I'm curious if any of you have experience with that um, or any insights about um, programs that you're familiar with. Uh, I do, we do not have any specific um, apprenticeship programs, but I, I mean, I like the idea. Um, we are definitely, we also build lead platinum certified for everything. And so for us, it's really important to have um, folks that are knowledgeable in green building design. And so um, finding contractors that know what they're doing as far as sealing up a building and installing solar and that sort of thing um, is really important, but it would be great if we had more, you know, solar installers locally. Um, and again, that comes to the affordable housing component because a lot of the um, entry level trades jobs do not pay well enough to live in these high cost areas without affordable housing. So I know I keep coming back to that, but unless we have housing for the people that, you know, do most of the things around here, um, we can't have a complete community. You know, I, I think you just brought something up though that we haven't really talked about and that's other types of TOD like um, E. ETOD um, or mixed, more mixed use and not for firmly housing focused. Does anyone want to talk a little bit about that? I, I, yes, I saw one of the comments about yes. the Soto station and it was just, it's my other trigger to the Rainier Beach station and the politics of that, you know, also go back a long ways. You know, the Seattle was very hesitant to increase zoning in industrial areas, right? So even um, give you an example, our stadium, the stadiums are so close to um, kind of the industrial areas and 20 years after the building of the stadiums, we're one of the only cities in the country that invested a billion dollars in stadiums and don't officially have a stadium district, which is typically <laughs> billions of dollars of economic development hotels. Instead, right across from our baseball stadium, we have a one story great floors warehouse. That's an extraordinary non-accomplishment for the city of Seattle and it's very unique. Similarly, Soto Station. I mean, yeah, we really should. I think it would be great to include like maybe the Puget Sound Reason, maybe ULI, you guys do a workshop with the UW on it. There could be tremendous potential, but again, there's that family wage jobs, therefore we don't touch. So I think, again, that's an educational process. Maybe that's old school Port of Seattle, but you have to say, look, um, there's an opportunity here to do. We've seen multi-story warehouses. We've seen, you know, one of the things that got excluded from industrial zones 20 years ago was um, artists, industrial live work lofts. You used to be able to build artist industrial housing. And so a lot of the industrial contingent, they outlawed this kind of use. So going back to this saying, okay, well, let's see what the Soto station could be. Would artists like to have their own spaces, live work industrial lofts with commercial, with residential, with small business incubators, with 85 feet of height? I think there's incredible opportunity. It's just you know, at that station that, and, and in Soto, there has not been the political will because there's just been that strong Port of Seattle, you know, traditional industrial contingent that doesn't want to introduce the mix of uses, even though it's already changing and you see all the wineries and all the different businesses going down there, we could be doing a lot more. And I do think housing could be a part of that, at least, you know, artist housing. So, okay. We could go on for a really long time about this. I see, I know Fred has a lot to say. I can tell by the way, the look on his face. However, we're running out of time and there's one final question that I think is gonna be fun and interesting for all of us. And that is like, if we fast forward, this is a lightning mm -hmm. round question. If we fast forward 25 years from now, what in your wildest dreams, what do you hope the conversation that we're having is? Angela. So I, yeah, I can start. So um, I would like the conversation to be is how the heck do we repurpose all of these car storage spaces that we have no use for because we actually have connection and walkability and um, interconnection with transit and we built all of this parking and what the heck do we do with it because 
how did we possibly take up so much space in our cities to hunks of metal that are just sitting most of the day? So that's, or maybe we've already had that conversation and we'll pass it by then. <laughs> Applause for that idea. Uh, Fred, what do you think? Yeah, good. This is a good question. Um, so I'm an optimist, but I do think mid-century, uh, the thing that's going to we're going to be talking about a lot is sea level rise. Um, and I think our greatest ch challenges as humans is in front of us. And, and we have to do everything we can do to get there. In this region, we're lucky. Our, our cities are built on hills, so um, we're, we'll be spared for a while. But um, I think we'll be talking about how TOD and whatever the future of TOD is can ac help accommodate um, all of the um, climate migrants that will be arriving from other parts of the country or world. But we can do it. We're smart. That's what I hope. We're innovative. We're an innovation corridor. Scott, what do you think? Well, my, my hope is that, you know, instead of like what's happened in the last 10 years where everything in the South Lake Union, everything grows all at once, that we kind of get into a nice rhythm of um, a little bit more consistent development, not overdevelopment. And so we actually have an opportunity to learn from each other and each building complement each other so that we get this cohesive, real mixed use, real livable neighborhoods, and that these serve as a great model. And 25 years from now, I would love to know that we've got two more expansions of the Sound Transit and that each of the neighborhoods now are looking to our neighborhoods, rather than looking to Portland and rather than looking to Vancouver, that we've actually created great examples of successful, livable, inclusive, you know, mixed use uh, transit oriented development. So I'd love to see us improve the model, share, learn from each other and, and really help perpetuate that. I love that. I think we should be in, in a world example. Um, well, thank you so very much, everyone, and thank you to PSRC for the opportunity. I think this has been a fascinating discussion. I'm really honored to have been part of it, and um, it was so nice working with all of these panelists. So have a have a wonderful rest of the event and a wonderful Friday and a weekend. Yeah. From PSRC, thank you all um, for the energy and creativity that you bring to this work that really is going to be transformational. Really appreciate you and your time and, and, and all the amazing work that you're doing. So thank you again. Thank you. So we will be transitioning into a break for 15 minutes um, where we will, um, after the, the break, we will have our more our, um, community led development panel discussion. So until then, um, get up, stretch your legs, go look at the rain outside for those of you who are in the central Puget Sound region, and we'll see you back at 11.
Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, hopefully you had time to stretch your legs and um, are ready for our second plenary panel, um, which is focused on community-led TOD. Um, I'm very grateful to introduce the facilitator of our next panel, um, Debbie Lacey, um, pronouns she, her, um, who is also a member of PSRC's Equity Advisory Committee. So we're really grateful for her time and her, her willingness to facilitate this panel. Um, Debbie currently lives in Kirkland and is the founder of Eastside for All, which convenes partners to transform policies, practices, investments, and relationships so that the needs and solutions of communities of color are centered. She works with community and government agencies to address gaps in access to opportunities, resources, and representation. So thank you so much um, for you all for being here this morning. And Debbie, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Ben. I'm really pleased to be here and thank you to PSRC for hosting. I did join the Equity Advisory um, Committee last year and it's been a great learning experience and a humbling one as well to be in the company of so many amazing leaders um, throughout our community uh, driving this work. And I have the great privilege of introducing you to a few of them today as part of the panel. Um, we do hope to have some time for questions at the end, fingers crossed, um, but we'll see how, how we go with the conversation. And I know our, our panelists could speak for hours and days on this topic, so we're glad that you're all here to talk about the importance of community in development. Um, just real briefly, I just wanted to put some context to the panel today for what we're going to be talking about. Uh, my own interest in equitable development started with third places and placemaking as a way to build belonging in communities. And I think about development, placemaking, and um, authentic community co-creation together as powerful strategies for healing, for bridging between parts of our community, and advancing equity ultimately, um, both in the process and the outcome of development with community. So I wanted to just quickly share this uh, definition of, of placemaking from the Project for Public Spaces. I think it gives a good frame for what we'll be talking about. Uh, they view placemaking as a collaborative process by which we can shape our public realm in order to maximize shared value. More than just promoting better urban design, placemaking facilitates creative patterns of use, paying particular attention to the physical, cultural, and social identities that define a place and support its ongoing evolution. So with that, I am just so honored to um, have our panelists introduce um, one another, introduce themselves rather. Um, and with that, you know, what is this community engagement that we always speak of? Uh, love for each panelist to share your particular take on community engagement as you introduce yourself. So I think we'll begin with um, Uche, please introduce yourself, welcome. Thank you, Debbie. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Uche Okezi. I'm the Director of Real Estate Development at Homesite. We are a community development corporation and a community development financial institution based in Southeast Seattle. Um, and, you know, in answer to your question about how I define community engagement, I was thinking about that. And I focused on the word engagement, and that, of course, made me think about marriage and how, you know, the developments that we create are um, sort of, you know, the marriage and the community engagement is that time before the marriage where you, you really work out um, what is needed to make it work and bring both everyone, you know, the benefits that will sustain the, the, um, the, um, the collaboration, the marriage, I guess you could say, you know, over the years. That's how I look at community engagement. Thank you, Uche. That's a beautiful analogy. I appreciate that. And let's go over to Miguel now. Miguel, welcome. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Debbie. Good morning, everyone. My name is Miguel Maestas. I am the Housing and Economic Development Director at El Centro de la Raza, which we translate as the Center for People of All Races. And this, this month, actually, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary since the founding of El Centro in 1972. So a special time for the organization. And, um, you know, in thinking about what community engagement means, um, you know, it, 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 uh, I think two things came to mind. Um, one is um, really working to create 
place and space and creating um, uh, uh, developments that that when we talk about the concept of placemaking, something that everyone sees uh, as a benefit, some something that has some something that has an element for everyone, where people see that, um, uh, it, particularly in mixed use developments, that they see that something is there that uh, that is for them, whether they're neighbors, whether they're uh, folks who are going to live in um, uh, affordable housing, uh, whether it's local businesses around the neighborhood, that people see that there's something there that benefits the entire neighborhood. And also, I think another thought is that um, that it really is about engaging and making sure that um, people who aren't traditionally at the table when it comes to to um, engagement uh, that their voices are heard, that their voices are raised. And how do you go about organizing and including people who aren't traditionally at the table? Thank you. Thank you, Miguel, and congratulations to El Centro. It's wonderful. Uh, Brandon, welcome. Thank you for being here as well. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, it's, it's great to be with you all this morning. Um, my name is Brendan Nelson, um, formerly served as the executive director of the Hilltop Action Coalition. Um, as I've recently um, really have ramped up um, a nonprofit that I've been working on for a number of years, but a group of uh, colleagues and um, so now we're really ramping up and it's called EPIC. And we've done a lot of the, it's a very small grassroots organization, but we've done a lot of work around um, working with individuals, families, um, organizations to help remove some of the barriers that we face when it comes to um, uh, economic development, when we think about transportation, when we think about uh, education and, and particularly for um, families of color and uh, individuals of color. And so um, we're, I'm really excited to move more into the work that we've been doing for a number of years, kind of more quietly, but now really um, taking it more, more broadly. Um, I think, uh, Luce, you, you really hit it on the head with the marriage piece. When I, um, it, that's something that really came into my head when we think about that word engagement. Um, it's really this, this connected, um, this sense of connectedness, but then we're on a journey together too. Um, that journey may not be known to us. We're going to hit some bumps in the road, but we are um, journeying together. And I think that's the beauty in it is that um, all voices are at the table. Uh, those who aren't typically heard are are welcomed in. And you know, th there's a difference to me between the outreach and engagement. Outreach is typically like we've done this work already. Let us hear from you a little bit. Versus engagement, it's like. We have some ideas, but we need you to walk us through this and, and um, um, come alongside us. So that's kind of where, where I would sit with that, that term. I love that, Brendan, journeying together. Thank you so much. Um, so it's really evident that you all bring this rich history, um, certainly a lot of passion, and uh, your communities have worked hard. Um, on uh, a lot of these initiatives. So um, we want to explore that a little bit more and have you share about development projects that your organization communities have worked on that have really been leading in this way with community. Um, we'll just continue that order if that's okay. And I might, I have some follow-up questions for a couple of you. So Uche, you want to begin? Um, sure. So, um... Homesites always worked with community prior to developing any of our housing projects, you know, to hear their concerns, the goals that they want the development to address and help achieve. Um, our largest project right now that we're working on is Othello Square, which is um, a transit oriented development project. It's located at the, um, the intersection of, excuse me, Martin Luther King Jr. Way South and um, South Othello Street here in Seattle, Southeast Seattle. And um, it's this particular project was, I think the most, was most significantly um, driven, was the most significantly driven project by community input. And that started with, you know, before the project was even um, 
um, imagine it started with using the 2009 um, neighborhood play, plan for the Othello neighborhood that was drafted and, and ratified in 2009 as the foundation. And then moving from there, um, we moved on to community meetings during, this is just during the feasibility phase, just to see what exact, how the community wanted the, that plan to be embodied in this particular project, both in, you know, most significantly in the programming, what sort of opportunities was the community wanting to see this project deliver? And then building around that, how that could be, how that could be brought forth. So we were able to bring in, um, uh, community uh, health, um, um, education from, you know, infancy all the way up to post-education in terms of our partnership with, you know, UW. Um, they built the UW Commons, which is um, across the street, or Kitty Caddy Corner, is that how you say that? <laughs> to, the, to where the development is housed, um, middle income housing, um, and then, you know, L the, um, the charter, the public charter elementary school that we brought. And so, um, and then we continue to have uh, worker meetings with the community, even though a couple of the buildings have been built, there's still a couple more that are still remaining. And we're always constantly, you know, um, engaging with the community, whether it's through events, um, through the monthly work group meetings that are open to all so that they can see how the project is continuing to progress, the sort of programming that we're continuing to house there. Um, we just wanna make sure that Othello continues to meet the goals and needs of the community. You said something really um, important there. I just wanted to lift up a bit, which is the, you, you said that community came together before the project was imagined. Right. And and essentially before the table was built, this wasn't about inviting people to a table. It sounds like it was really a lot of intention around exploring, keeping the, the, the questions open and everyone's minds and hearts open and then seeing what emerged from that. Would you say that that's accurate and yes. talk maybe a little bit more about why that's important in community for for you? And I'll have uh, Brendan hop in after that. Well, I think, you know, just like Miguel and Brandon have said, it's making sure that the people whose voices have not really been elevated, even though they're the ones that are supposed to be benefiting from whatever it is that the whatever is being developed, to make sure that th their voices are heard, that we're actually producing something that they feel is going to benefit them. And so we really wanted to be intentional about what we were doing for our community. Go ahead, Brendan, hop in. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'm i just excited to hear about um, this work. And so um, a few things that we've done, um, you know, we have what is called the Hilltop Subarea Plan. And on the outward facing, it looks really, really great. And like, wow, all these, you know, things are gonna be coming to our community up through 2025 and a little bit beyond. But what our organization found was an, was an issue was that as we've already shared, the people that uh, these developments would really impact were not consulted, were not engaged in any type of process. And if there were things that, that were brought to the community, it was like, hey, we, we had a 7.30 breakfast coffee meeting and you know that was our engagement. We did a series of those. Well, who's showing up to 7.30 a.m. meetings, right? Um, not the folks that you really wanna, wanna hear from. And so we really pushed back on, on the city around that. So even though this plan was already developed, we knew things were coming. We said, okay, if they're going to come, we want to be um, a part of, of the process from kind of beginning to end. And it started with a group called the Hilltop Engagement Committee uh, that our um, uh, Mayor Woodage had appointed about 15 people to, to this committee. And the beauty of, of the committee was that it was comprised of folks from all across the Hilltop neighborhood, from um, business owners to residents to, uh, we had some youth on there, we had uh, different ages. Um, and to journey along from the very beginning, and this was for, for the um, uh, light rail that was coming through. And to be a part of that process, to see from beginning to end, like we had voice in what uh, placemaking signs were gonna look like, 
uh, what type of trees we wanted to put on the corridor, what type of benches, and just the impact of what that transit was going to look like for um, our community. And then you had the real clear voice of folks that are represented. And then from that group, taking it to the community with a series of meetings, not just at 730 in the morning, but you had a series of meetings throughout the day and the evening where, where we provided childcare for folks who needed to bring their children. We had dinner provided um, if it was during a dinner time. And that way we were able to solicit really great feedback. And so we've encouraged other organizations to kind of take um, a similar model or other developers. Um, and most recently a project that we um, uh, worked on, we put together a group pretty similar and we call it the Community Investment Council. And this was um, a group that was comprised of, of um, about 20 um, um, Black Native folks from the Hilltop community that have been displaced or in danger of being displaced to um, you know, journey along with this developer around what they were going to be building in our, in our community. And so um, we just sunset that group um, just right uh, let's say about six months ago, but we journeyed together right at, right as the as we shut down for COVID. It was our very first meeting. We had one meeting, and then two weeks later we shut down for COVID, so everything went virtual. But they journeyed with us this entire time, and we we gave them a stipend for each meeting, knowing that their time was was uh, important. Um, so we wanted to honor that, and so. Uh, these developers worked with people from the community. If you're going to be doing work around black uh, black home ownership, you got to be talking to the black folks from from the community. And so we thought that was a really great uh, model of of engagement. You're you're right alongside the architect. You're right alongside the the developer, um, and that's really had had some um, extreme impact. Thank you, Brendan. Yeah, you you really um, spoke to some of the uh, considerations when you really want to support community to be engaged long term, whether it's the time of day when you're meeting or providing those stipends, like you said, and uh, uh, really appreciated hearing about the Community Investment Council made a special note of that. <laughs> we'll talk to you about that later. Um, Miguel, with a half century of experience and history of El Centro de la Raza, I know you've, uh, you're have you well versed in community led development. What are some um, of the projects you'd like to highlight in the ways that you've collaborated with community along the way? Well, you know, throughout El Centro's history, it, it's been about organizing community and raising the voices of, of, uh, of uh, low-income and disenfranchised people. And, um, you know, at, and a very similar, very similar uh, experiences and uh, to what Uche and Brendan have shared is that, you know, when when our development Plaza Roberto Maez uh, was, the construction was completed in 2016, but going back when, uh, it, it, and we're right across the street from the Beacon Hill light rail station. So when we learned that the light rail station was coming to Beacon Hill, this was uh, some 20, 20 or so years ago, um, you know, People started to knock on the door. People wanted to buy the the property that was between the historic building and and the and the light rail station. You know, private developers. People wanted to partner. People lots of interest in that land. As soon as we as as it was known that a light rail station was going to be right across the street, so we realized very quickly that we had to figure out uh, and really understand the possibilities and and do something that helped. Um, expand the ability of our organization to carry out its mission. Obviously it was an opportunity. Um, but you know part of that was was growing our capacity and really partnering um, you know with, with good partners that that could um, uh, that could guide us but also listen to what our goals were as an organization. And so it, it, in those neighborhood, you know in the in the neighborhood planning meetings, even you know years before we began to organize people and say we have to be at the neighborhood planning meetings because we have to make sure that uh, uh, voices are heard that that uh, there's a there's a very broad range of of uh, input as to what's going to happen on the Beacon Hill neighborhood plan. This was probably around 2009, similar timeline that Uche was sharing. And it's like, you know, and 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 what came out of that um, generally was was a support for affordable housing, 
but also community space, community gathering space, um, retail or a business commercial space, uh, cultural uh, space, and, and uh, support for the development of, of early childhood uh, facility. So, um, so that so when it came time to actually, um, you know, pencil out how the development was going to look, those things were already part of the the neighborhood plan, and so that that early uh, uh, community involvement was very very important. And so as we began to develop the plan, it, it, we had to continue. We had had to continue to make sure that we had plenty of neighborhood meetings. That, like Brendan said, that. You do it at times when people can come, provide translation, provide meals, childcare, um, and 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 I'll I'll share a little bit more about this. But it's in, we it's very important to partner with trusted folks in the community that can bring help bring people to the table. And so we um, so as the as the development unfolded, it, it we were able to create a development that had those elements in addition to. To the affordable housing and, and El Centro's, um, you know, uh, humble response to the affordable housing crisis in in the Seattle area, um, it did. We were able to do some retail spaces and really look at bringing in neighborhood businesses and small businesses. Um, the the uh, uh, a large area for a plaza that was open to all people and seven brand new classes of child development center uh, space and. Um, and also a, a cultural space, uh, our Centilia Cultural Center, um, and then and then using that that plaza as a as a as a tool for economic development for small business vendors, for food vendors, uh, and really create a sense of community. Bring all of those elements together to to create um, a community, and and like I mentioned before, to show a benefit for everyone in the neighborhood, um, whether you were. Uh, a family that now had affordable housing next to light rail or neighbors uh, in, in the neighborhood. You had access to childcare, to gathering space, to a beautiful public plaza and marketplace. So um, really developing elements that the entire neighborhood saw as a benefit. And even going door to door, we did, a, we did an economic analysis of you know, the impact, the economic benefit of 112 families moving into the neighborhood near the light rail. And you know, um, and we knocked on every door of every business in the neighborhood and said, you know, the folks that are going to live in this, it, it is, it is, uh, you know, serving people between thirty and sixty percent area median income. But people buy groceries, they get their hair cut, they they go out to eat, you know. And so we did a, an analysis that it was um, about three and a half million dollars of purchasing power of. Uh, 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 in the neighborhood that was going to happen from the people that were moving in and business owners hadn't really heard that perspective before hadn't really thought about how it was going to help grow their their uh their market and their businesses as well so really um doing so in a way and involving community in a way um that showed the the benefit and 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 uh uh as well to to the entire neighborhood and make sure that that um that the the uh, that voices were heard. Can I add something to um, I I love the piece of kind of door to door. Um, I I call it boots on the ground because there's that kind of missing, I say kind of like the missing group, right? And it's often our 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 elders and and particularly in in the hilltop community, we we have a large population of, of seniors within our communities that can't get to a lot of these meetings, we have developments now that have been built to, um, on to house them. So we're getting more um, in, into those sites. We're doing outreach, but, you know, about five or six years ago, it was really like getting to those neighbors' houses, sitting on their front porches, you know, uh, doing surveys, getting feedback, and to be able to hear those stories of 50, 60 years of seeing the community change and what their hopes and dreams are, just, a, just amazing. So that just sparked me when you, when you said, um, you know, um, door to door. COVID has taken that away from us a lot. And, um, but I know with our organization, we're slowly trying to get back into, into that because there was so much power in, in, in that, that connection that way. 
Thank you, uh, Miguel and Brandon. That that was uh, really helpful to to talk about. Also, we're, you can hear it. We're putting the context too into COVID and and what we've all just been through collectively, and the way that that's impacted the work in communities too. Um, I'm going to kind of combine the next couple of questions to to you know this can be a roller coaster, right? In communities, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it together. So um, starting with Uche, wondering, you know, what have been some of the more positive outcomes that you saw? Um, and then also some of the challenges and barriers and uh, in this journeying together, borrowing from, from Brendan's term, how, how would you talk about the roller coaster that can be present in these kind of efforts? Uh, well, you know, it, when we first started, I think the most, the positive, the most positive, I think, was being able to reach, you know, all of the different levels of community in terms of the engagement that we were trying to do to, to, um, to get a community approval for this project. It's basically, you know, it's approval. We, we as a community development corporation don't just come in and, and put things down and don't consult, don't ask, you know, how can we be sure that what we're doing is something that folks are needing. And so um, just being able to, to approaching it from the sense that we wanted their approval, you know, really helped in terms of building uh, trust, you know, with the community um, so that they understood that what we were really trying to do was, you know, bring, connect them to greater opportunity, you know, whether it was through programming or opportunities to build assets through, you know, um, you know, ownership of residential ownership or, or commercial ownership. And we, uh, we've expanded the work that we're doing, not just in the Othello Square, but other, other existing businesses and other areas in the Othello neighborhood. Um, and then of course there was the pandemic. And so that's like the down, the, <laughs> the downward trajectory of the roller coaster and how that affected what, in, both in terms of delay, the project delays that have occurred as well as being able to reach out to the community members now as Brendan and uh, was saying, it, it's a lot harder to do that face-to-face. -face. You know, there's this reliance on um, uh, virtual meetings, but not everybody has that level of technological savvy. So how do you still reach out to people and still make them feel included, you know, in what's happening, whether it's, you know, through um, mailing or still door-to-door -door knocking, which we, we still do, uh, but still with that sense, you know, with all of the COVID protocols. Um, I would say that, you know, the biggest challenge is always listening and being able to honestly, authentically respond because you can't always do everything. A project is limited by how much, how big the budget is, how much money, that how much, the sources that you have. And so being honest about what it is you can and can't do, but always um, making sure that you are doing the best that you can. Thank you, Ushe, yes, yes. Um, we'll leave it at that as far as COVID and all, all the challenges, but it, it was a really great to hear that you know, some of the positives that you've seen is the, the way that this did bring community together and um, voices from, from folks who maybe had never participated in something like that before to that level. So that's that's really great. Brendan, you wanna go next on the, the positives and the challenges? Yeah, I, um, I'm gonna kind of spin it a little bit and, and, and um, early COVID people didn't really under, like understand what I was saying when I would say this, but I found I found the good in COVID, right? We we got to a point where we were like, we've been on lockdown for so long, we got to find some good in this. And so some of the um, successes in, that we had, so I'll, I'll go back to the group that I mentioned, it was called the Community Investment Council. We had one in-person meeting and then we went everything virtual. And now we have a group of people ranging from you know, early 20s, to people in their early 80s, right? So you can, you know, that um, demographic is very different. So we're we're going virtual, and we have folks saying, "I don't have a computer. Um, I'm not sure how to use Zoom and all that." And so, um, you know, taking those, what we did was did some one-on-ones um, as leads. We did one-on-ones with folks 
who didn't know about the technology, how to use Zoom, got them up to speed. Um, and with community partners and other organizations um, that were able to receive funds, um, we were able to buy um, tablets for folks to be able to engage with those, um, with those meetings um, and other uh, tools that, that would help navigate that. And so, you know, what we've seen in a lot of the success was we had organizations that were like, we got to lean in more to the community. What do you need? So in particularly for our organization, we had groups saying, we know that y'all are doing outreach. You're trying to get to the most vulnerable in our, in our communities. What is, what is it that you need? And so we were um, hot spots for families to be able to engage with, with, you know, so they can engage virtually with meetings. So getting internet access, um, tablets. We had organizations that um, brought in uh, older laptops that we were able to take to another organization out in Seattle to get refurbished, got those into the hands of people so they could be involved with this because the work, a lot of the work was still happening. And we were like, we don't want the work and these developments to keep moving forward and the voices aren't there. So if y'all want to engage, let's let's think about it this way. And so those were definitely some of the um, successes. And again, just challenges, timelines, you know, things being held up. Um, we're, we're having some conversation within our community now of, um, of an organization that was doing some really great work, COVID hit, some things slowed down. And now our community is saying, we don't trust you. We, we, you, you told us this was gonna happen and this hasn't happened. So now we're working on, okay, how, how do we build that trust back up? So we're thinking about hosting an open house, re-engaging folks about the things that, some of the successes that have occurred and being transparent with some of those challenges that have, that have taken place. Um, I really feel like the biggest thing is when we think about development and engaging with communities, we have to be transparent. Um, I often say no update is an update. If there's no say, say, hey, community, we don't have an update right now. And for them, that's an update. But we can't go silent um, when these projects are happening because that, that's where you lose, lose trust. So that's been a big challenge for us is like maintaining that trust factor and thinking about the history of our community being you know um, a, a marginalized community one is often overlooked when these massive projects come through and things slow down and nobody hears anything it's just like okay another thing that you know we are just kind of thrown thrown at and nobody's really caring about what we need and so we're really trying to work around that and i would love to talk more with folks who may have um experience some of these same things to hear more ideas and thoughts around what we could be doing um, differently. Because one thing we're saying is our community, which is a 150 year historically black community, which has been erased. It's not the story that's being told. We're trying to amplify and bring that back. But that's been the history of like, let's bring something to your community. We'll say we're working with you, but really we're not. And then we'll put it out there. And then there you go. You're welcome. And so um, we're you know, right now there are a couple different developers working and the community just doesn't have trust. And so we're trying to figure out how we can reconcile because the, those projects are, are going to continue, but we want to make sure it's those, our voices are continuing to being heard. Thank you, Brendan. Yeah, we keep hearing this theme of trust and, you know, the constant healing and sometimes repair work that's needed, um, it, particularly in our communities who have seen it all <laughs> um, and unfortunately been on the receiving end of, of a lot of harmful practices. And so it, it takes time to build that trust and keep it. Um, Miguel, your thoughts on um, some of the highlights that you've seen positive um, developments and then maybe the challenges and, and barriers that you've also seen. Sure, I think I think I'll start with the challenges because then some of the highlights actually relate to those. So, um, you know, a couple of challenges I, I would share is is that one um, was you know as a as a community based organization that had done a, a small fourteen unit um, affordable housing development about uh, twenty five years ago. You know, the challenge really was capacity and being able to uh, as an organization be the developer. Uh, of a project. And so, um, you know, it, all, all that it took to, to, um, to develop that capacity to have the policies, the procedures, the, the 
fiscal uh, structure and uh, and finances in place to be able to say we're that, that we we can get the funding that funders saw it as a viable project. You know that that really took years for our organization to put together. And oftentimes we're approached by other other organizations in communities of color, churches, community based organizations that have land or have property that want to be part of the um, the 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 solution to the affordable housing crisis. And and we share what we learned. We share our policies. We share whatever we can because we remember how how much of a huge lift it was for our organization to build that capacity, um, and it's and and the importance of having good partners to be able to do that. So um, the other the other thing I would say is that you know when we were getting closer to to the development uh, uh, up on Beacon Hill, that um, there was some initial opposition and it actually um, delayed the the project for a year and we had to organize. We 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 went back and and said we have to organize our community and we we as part we set up. Uh, laptops. We help people write emails. Uh, even participants in our senior program and our in our food bank and really uh, shared um, what the vision was and and ha had had about three hundred people respond and write in support of the project. And then all of the meetings that took place to make sure that people were informed, that people's ideas were heard. Um, those were a positive things that came out of out of the challenges. Um, and then I, I would just share another another um, wonderful thing that I think came out of our development was our uh, the ability to include um, art, permanent art in the development. And you know when we first were really hearing from community and understood the importance of art and how art and culture helps create a beautiful, dignified place. It helps um, uh, create a sense of of of. of, of, of belonging for for everyone people that live there work there the neighborhood and there and there was questions raised of how how were we going to be able to use or use you know uh, the funds for developing affordable housing for art and we and the guidelines called for a brick facade and we said well, well we can construct tile mosaic murals into the into the um property and and utilized a a, a artists from from diverse communities created beautiful art reflecting lots of cultures and um and when it was all said and then created permanent art that um through tile mosaic which is which is um <clears throat> we have about 45 different tile mosaic murals that go around the development and um when it was all said and done it was actually uh, uh, more cost effective than the brick facade was going to be um and so and and I, i'm happy to say that in the six years since the development has gone up we haven't had a single incident of, of vandalism on any of the art and it um really ha i think we've we've been part of that effort to really say that 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 is an important part of creating community space welcoming space um uh, as part of our developments that's, that's exciting that the, those positives coming out and the art focus there. I, I loved hearing about that and that sense of shared ownership, you know, keeps communities safe and, you know, um, protects the art that the community themselves have had a part in bringing there for, for their enjoyment and their, their community support. Um, so much more we could talk about, but I do want to, I want to hear from each of you about you know, what, as, as folks are here um, gathered um, from all different sectors and focused on this topic, what is it that you hope people will, you know, um, know about or think about differently, do differently um, when it comes to uh, community focused development? Um, and, and please also feel free to share if you have announcements coming up about your efforts and your organizations and communities. Uh, Uche, why don't we start with you again? Um, sure. So I would say, um, most importantly, I think is, you know, to look at engagement with the community um, as an asset and not through a deficit lens. You know, it could be your superpower if you're taking into account what it is that the folks that are going to be using this development, whether they're using the community spaces, whether they're, you know, um, purchasing or renting residential units or the um, 
the, you know, the retail spaces, you know, take their, the, what, what they need into account as you're doing your development. And then as Brandon said, communication is so, so, so important so that folks don't feel left out. You know, um, constant updating, communicate, um, community engagement should be woven into the project from the very beginning and be an ongoing thing, part of the process of development and not as an afterthought. Yeah, just adding on to that, and, it, it, and this kind of ties into the question that I think that has um, been presented in the Q&A. Um, it, I think, you know, thinking creatively about how you can engage with folks. I think that that's one thing that COVID brought us to was like, wow, we got to think a little bit uh, uh, more creatively about how we're going to engage and, and do things. I mean, I've learned now how to use virtual tools that I probably wouldn't have learned, um, you know, had it not been, been for COVID. But one of the things that um, we have seen to kind of answer the question in the chat is that people do get tired from participation. Like we don't, we haven't heard what's going on and so on and so on. What we've done, like with the groups that we've put together, we've put like, um, hey, let, we're gonna do a six month um, working group together. And in that, you know, we'll be updating you along um, in this process. And that's where we ask these developers and folks doing the work to be as transparent and clear as possible. If you're if there's red tape, say, hey, there's red tape and we're not able to navigate around this. It's much better to say that than not to say anything because then people feel like, okay, you're, you're being transparent. That helps with, with the um, trust building. But also in there, as things kind of slow and stall, um, we've put some things in, in between there to kind of help with the momentum, whether it's like, hey, we're gonna gather for, um, for a um, happy hour, just to thank you for the time that you, you've put in. Uh, we may have some things to share there. You know, so trying to put some in, some things in place that keep people um, kind of engaged and, and excited about the work. We found that to be successful. I know one, one particular project, we waited just a little bit too long um, because, you know, folks were transitioning from different places, you know, into new jobs when the great resignation hit. So it was like, oh man, we missed an opportunity. And so we had to go back and really try to um, uh, fix some of those things, which ended up being well, but I would say finding ways to engage with people, whether that's, you know, e-news blasts more regularly. Um, you know, we've done some really fun um, kind of live videos. Hey, we're at the development. Here's what's, here's what's going on on site right now. Just some, some of those creative ways. Thank you, Brandon. Looks like we have a couple minutes left for Miguel. Um, how would you uh, answer this question about what, how everybody can support these initiatives? I think what, one thing that I would share is, you know, in, in communities where, where, where folks are working or working on development, um, to, to partner with trusted entities, partner with trusted organizations, because, you know, helping the, the, the whole um, effort to bring, make sure that um, people's voices are represented, are represented who uh, may not um, typically be at the table. That we found a, uh, that it's very helpful to make sure that you're partnering with trusted entities. And because, um, and I'll give an example, like, um, you know, we wanted our seniors to be part of the, the, the input on, on the development. And they they love the senior coordinators and they they trust them. There's a relationship there, and 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 so it was um, having them go out and invite and really explain why we wanted their input. But that example of like partnering with community organizations that have um, the relationship and and have access to folks and doing so in a way where um, it's a partnership where those community organizations are part of the leadership and that helps to make sure that things are community led. Um, but, but um, and, and working with ent entities in, in communities that, that have connection with people and have uh, the trust of people and really looking at how you partnership, making sure the resources are there. Cause if, you know, in the example of as, as a nonprofit, oftentimes we get asked to like connect with community or make connections with community, but it, but it also takes 
time and resources. So making sure that that you know there's the effort to really um, make sure that the the resources are there for for good partnership that that makes sense for organizations as well. Um, and just some quick announcements. We're very happy that um, we will be. Um, breaking ground er in early 2023 on a, our, our next big affordable housing development at Columbia City, um, which will have 87 units of affordable housing and four classrooms of childcare. And in partnership with the Church of Hope, where they'll have the, a new uh, space as well as uh, Consejo counseling uh, offices there. So we're happy, very happy about that. And we also just purchased a property down in Federal Way that has a skating rink on it, and we're going to keep the skating rink operating and and look for uh, and, and look to develop that property um, with offices and senior and youth services and affordable housing and childcare and, and a market and a park. So some long term ambitious plans for some property we just we acquired in Federal Way. So some some good exciting uh, future work happening at El Centro. So thank you. So Debbie, I know we're we're at our time, and there's some questions coming through. Um, would you be sharing our our contact info? Maybe folks want to follow up, and we can answer some of those um, questions as well in the chat. It will probably take a while to explain um, some of the ways that we're we're doing with our organization. But I would love to connect with folks if they're open to it. Um, to follow up. Yes, um, Ben, can you answer that? And yeah, I just, just quick and I'll pop back on. off. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead. We, we've had this question um, several times. So yes, we'll be posting as long as you're amenable, your contact information and information for your organizations um, on the event website, which will update the program and we'll send out notice to everybody that will do that. So thank you for be, being willing to follow up. Great questions and we can't get to them all. Yeah. Well, with that, um, thank you, Ben. Thank you, uh, Miguel, Brendan, Uche. Uh, so inspiring. I know there's been some talk about we should have, you know, an annual summit at least on, you know, highlighting these community-based uh, projects and developments. And I think that would be fantastic just to continue the conversation and have a an ongoing spotlight on um, some of the local examples here that that we all um, cherish and respect. Certainly, from my my point of view too. So, thank you all. So, so much. Thank you, PSRC. And uh, we hope you'll have a, a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. All right, so I'll take it from here. So um, thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, my name is David Killingstead. I'm the Long Range Planning Manager for Snohomish County. I am one of the co-chairs, uh, two co-chairs for the regional TOD uh, committee that that uh, hosted this wonderful uh, morning of uh, very inspiring uh, uh, conversations. And my co-chair is Patience. Patience, do you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely, David. I have been inspired just listening to all the panels this morning. I'm Patience Malaba. I am the executive director at the Housing Development Consortium and get to co-chair the uh, committee with David. Thank you. Um, I did want to just kind of just kind of recap. I know we've got just a few minutes left before the 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 end of our program here, but um, um, I can't help but just sort of reflecting on just the the vast amount of information I know for for many of you and and looking. It was wonderful to see uh, people far and wide, not only from across this uh, wonderful region, but across the state and folks even um, outside the, the state of Washington that have joined us. Uh, and I really wish we could get to all the questions here because there's some great questions and I hope we'll, we'll have an, there'll be an opportunity to get them all answered and, and out via email from, from PSRC staff and the, the panelists here. But a um, uh, lot, to, lot to absorb, uh, a lot, uh, I, I almost wanna think of it as like a fire hose in a way of just the amount of information uh, that was presented here this morning. Uh, and I think, it is a, a reflection on the fact that we were able to bring you uh, both perspectives uh, from folks who are kind of in the trenches, really on both sides, both in, on the side of, of constructing and, and bringing TOD to neighborhoods, but also as you just heard from folks who are, who are on the other side, 
um, and who are in these neighborhoods that are that are seeing uh, these changes happen. And I think it is it is wonderful that we can bring both those perspectives um, into a forum like this. And and I do agree um, uh, with the comment that that it'd be nice to have more perspectives from folks in these neighborhoods uh, and being able to hear their stories uh, about how uh, either they've been impacted or or how they're working to to um, uh, to improve their neighborhoods and 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 create uh, opportunities. Um, this really is a, a, a takes a village um, if we're going to succeed in in bringing all uh, uh, providing enough uh, enough space for that one plus million people that we're planning for. Patients, did are there any observations that you'd like to share? Yeah, David, just in line with what you just said, I mean, the value of convening the diversity of voices that we just did today is to share best practices and learn from each other. But I think one thing that it also does is it reinforces that it can be done because we're growing as a region. Uh, we are making historic investments in transit infrastructure. We're expecting a million people to live near high capacity transit by 2050. And in order for us to do the necessary planning, we really are behooved as a community to be sure that it's community oriented development. And in borrowing some of the words from Brandon, it is genning together as a community to make that possible. There were about four items that I wanted to highlight that I took away throughout this section. Number one is that we do need to plan for complete communities. And we do need to bring voices of people most impacted to the table as we do the planning proactively. I mean, we've done this Roberto Maestas Plaza as an example, that's a model for the nation. We've done this with 12th Avenue Arts and we continue to do this. And it's not just the nonprofit affordable housing providers who are doing this on the ground. It is also private partners. We're coming right in. We had from Scott, the Grand Street Commons Project. That's a partnership with nonprofit organizations and bring over 500 units on the ground. That's housing that we most definitely need. And then number two, we do need to prioritize beyond transit infrastructure ways that we're moving people around. I think we had this from the second panel, the emphasis that it's not just the infrastructure and the buildings, it's also about how people can move. But the third one that I also think is important for us to really take away from the panelists is that for the planning to be effective, we need local policies to be passed to make that housing possible. What I had in just listening to uh, Scott walk through some of the different tools they had to use, he talked about some land use and zoning changes that were made to make those projects possible from the incentives that are provided through multifamily tax exemption uh, to the inclusionary zoning requirements that are under the MHA program uh, to some of the ability of the city to chime in or the departments at the state level to be sure that we're mitigating some of the climate impacts that could happen with uh, sites that are contaminated. So it's a lot of work that really gets us there well ahead of time so we can get to that 10 year period and look back and say we've done it. But I wanna close with one thing that Angela said that really stood with me, which was that unless we have affordable housing or housing that people can afford, especially people working in our communities with limited means, we cannot have complete communities. And I can't underscore how important that point is for us to continue to think about and carry as we take away from this summit. Thank you, patient. And I would definitely occur, concur with the comment that you made. It is a challenge when, when uh, people who want to live in the community they grew up in aren't able to afford to live there and must move away. Uh, as we heard today, equitable TOD can only be achieved when we bring a diverse set of voices to the table and include the those most impacted by development in the planning process. At PSRC, we have the Regional Transit Oriented Development Committee, which Patience and I chair, to convene a broad coalition of stakeholders focused on identifying and advancing promising equitable transit oriented development practices, conducting performance monitoring, and supporting local efforts to take equitable TOD from theory to practice. 
The committee hosts these full day events every other year to bring together community leaders, ind industry leaders, and transit lovers to learn from one another, to celebrate successes and learn from our missteps. We hope you will stay engaged with the regional TOD work. Keep an eye out for future webinars and other events. Thanks again uh, to the attendees, panelists, and to PSRC staff, uh, and the upcoming walking tours, um, uh, the folks uh, behind those uh, for making this an important work. And I'm gonna kick it back over to Patience. Thank you. And I believe this question was asked throughout the webinar. Uh, an email will be shared next week uh, with all of the information that was shared today. It will be sent to all registered attendees. There will be a feedback form included, and we are asking you to let us know what was valuable about today's program. What can we do in the future to make this kind of event even better for you? Uh, there are CM credits that are available for the morning webinar and the afternoon walking tours, and more information on those will be shared soon. So for the planners on the call, look out for that information. And thanks again for joining us today and enjoy your afternoon. Ben, over to you to close us off. Thank you, Patience. Thank you, David. And thank to, thanks to all the attendees. Um, really great event, very inspiring. And, and I'm optimistic that there are so many great people working across communities and across the, the development industry that are really taking, uh, really understand how our approaches need to change to have equitable transit oriented communities throughout the region. One request from everybody as, as you close out of the webinar automatically, a, um, a, a very short demographic survey will be will pop up in a, in a new window. We ask that you please fill that out. It's Title VI of the Civil Rights Act um, requires that we collect information if we can about um, people who are participating in public decision making. And um, we'd love to have that information um, for our federal partners. So thank you all. Um, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Enjoy the rain. Enjoy the smoke-free skies. And um, for those of you who are going out in the on the walking tours, you should have received um, emails with um, location information and, um, and timing and all of that. So thanks again. And um, uh, yeah, have a great weekend. Okay, bye.